Okay. All right. Ah, okay. I hear it is good evening and at your place it is good morning, of course, yes. because you just have woke up from the bed and yes, yes, uh, yes. it is 7.30 in the morning, I think, no, there and we are uh, here at yeah, 8.00. which is perfectly fine. Yes. Um, uh, uh, okay. I so, am waiting to see. I uploaded my presentation. I just want to see if I can. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, good. Okay. okay. All right. So oh, let us start. Uh, the participants are joining already. About 200 has joined, and some more we are expecting will join. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you see, this is the program which uh, we are bringing jointly from the Federation of Film Societies of India centrally and the FIPRESKI India. FIPRESKI India is the International Federation of Film Critics. From its India chapter, we are holding this master class today with you. And uh, uh, before uh, going to your session, let me introduce you a little bit with the participants. Uh, you see, uh, my dear friends, uh, Dr. Bedabrata Pine, who is here today for the masterclass on the digital camera, he is one of the inventors of CMOS, Digital Image Sensor Technology, that enabled the digital camera revolution from cell phones to movie cameras. Dr. Bedabrata Pine holds over 90 patents and is an inductee to the U.S. Space Technology Hall of Fame. He was an award-winning senior research scientist at NASA and Caltech for over 15 years till he quit NASA to become a filmmaker. And with his debut film, Chittagong, in 2013, he won four Indian national awards, including the prestigious Golden Lotus as the best first film and the best debut director, as well as awards in several international film festivals. Earlier, he was the executive producer of internationally acclaimed AMU 2005 and a documentary called Lifting the Veil 1997 and the writer of the book titled Behind the Events in Kashmir 1991. He received his B.Tech degree from IIT Kharagpur in 1986 and his master's MS and PhD degrees from Columbia University in 1992. He taught courses in UCLA and has received prestigious yeah. awards such as the Liu Allen Award, NASA Inventors Award and IIT Distinguished Alumnus Award. In addition to filmmaking, he is a technology consultant to a number of camera companies, including leading movie camera makers such as RED. He has a keen interest in history, politics, philosophy, and quantum physics. He is currently working on a number of feature films and web series. We are expecting very soon another feature film from him. And we are very happy to have him for this program. We had to uh, make plans for a long time because he is too busy. So, from the uh, on behalf of Federation of Film Societies and from Fepreski India, we are happy to have him here today. And uh, the uh, session will be like this. Uh, uh, Dr. Pedro Broto Pine will present uh, his uh, speech first, and uh, then by this time, I will request the participant not to shoot many questions; otherwise, those may lost. It is better when the presentation is over. By that time, if you just push your question so that we can discuss over it. So uh, let us start. Uh, uh, let us start the session. Now it is the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Praminda. Uh, Praminda, Praminda, Praminda Mojundar, I know for a long time, and he has been uh, asking me to do this 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 kind of a course uh, in different formats for a, for a very long time and uh, i've always been interested in doing it the only issue problem is that it, it takes a long time to prepare for uh, something like this and uh, and so but i but this time i don't have much of an excuse since thanks to covid we are all sitting uh, well i won't say workless but uh, but uh, we probably have lost a lot of our excuses of of uh, being busy so so here i am uh, i would be uh, talking for for a while i, I looked at the, the amount of presentation it's, it's a pre pretty substantial so let's see when you guys uh, fall off uh, 
as one good thing is that if you are sleeping through my presentation i won't have no way, any way of knowing it so that's that's one of the great things about this uh, this uh, this video based uh, uh, webinars classes whatever you want to call it um, and uh, what i'm going to do is that i've got, I've got a presentation so i'm going to work primarily of the, of the the powerpoint and i will show a few movies short move short clips uh, talking about what what you know showing uh, what what it is about the the images or the moving images that that I want to highlight. Um, I will go approximately like this. I will talk about the technology thing first, but I'm going to keep it. Don't don't be afraid. I'm going to keep it as um, minimal as possible. There will be a few equations here and there, but I would try to go to an image or a movie very soon after that so that you are, your eyes don't glaze over. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the technology, how it applies to you know the, the, the image perception, uh, how we control the image, per, uh, image, um, and how the technology and, and that that image interact with each other. Uh, from there, we go go to different kinds of formats of of uh, cameras that we have, and what kind of uh, image quality uh, we can expect. What is it that we are looking for in the, when we, when you're evaluating an image? Uh, and this is especially important because uh, even though we consume movies today in, a, in movies, uh, web series, TV shows in a, in a very, very big way, I feel that a lot of our, our uh, aesthetics have gotten set by what we watch on TV, which uh, especially in India, uh, forgetting about the content, the image quality is uh, nothing to write home about. The same can be said about perhaps uh, the aesthetics of Bollywood. So I think there's 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 got to be some discussion, and we will we will talk about that in the end when we when we come to question answers. Um, and I think I will end with uh, clips about showing comparison of different cameras, what what you get, what you don't get, where one one should use one and not the other, and uh, things of that nature. And of course, there's always that question, uh, film versus digital, that that comes up, and and I think that would be strewn around throughout that. Uh, what does it mean, film versus digital? So, let without uh, any more ado, let me start the the, the presentation. Um, I hope you can see the PowerPoint slide. It says digital camera technology perception aesthetics. Um, I want to make sure uh, that uh, that that you guys can. Uh, Preminder, it would be great if you can confirm that you can see it. Uh, yes, yes, we can see it. The presentation okay. is so yes. then we can, I can, I can get started. All right. Yeah. Um, yes. So um, let's see. Where do I go? Okay. The first slide. I'm, I'm trying to get used to this presentation. Thing. All right. Here it is. So this digital camera that we 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 see today, kind of, it began. Uh, in 1991, 92, in, in JPL Caltech, um, as this uh, CMOS active pixel sensors, this our team, Eric Fossum, uh, Sabrina, Suni, Richard Nixon, myself, uh, and what you see on the left. By the way, can you see my uh, my cursor when I when I move my cursor around? Uh, not really. The cursor we can't see. Again, uh, you please. Uh, right. I don't know how to point to what I'm looking at. Um, is there a uh, window that I can always? Hmm. You can't see the cursor, huh? No. That's that's a, that's a shame. Well, anyway, uh, we will <coughs> we will make do without it. Um, so, in 1992, there's the first CMOS active pixel sensors. You can see this 28 by 28 uh, pixel sensor. 28 by 28. Uh, yes. This is legacy. This is this is this is history. Uh, in '95, first digital camera on a chip, where uh, alongside the sensor, uh, we also put in the the, the uh, A to D converters, ADCs, and uh, a controller. So all of that became a single chip from which you can run a, a camera, and that kind of changed the whole thing. I mean, we just showed that in CMOS, one can do good quality imaging, and then came the, the the cell phone cameras. I mean, when it first came, it was like, why would you use a camera on a cell phone, which is for uh, audio? 
for audio communication and and now it's it's life has come full circle uh, by the way this is the first single chip digital camera that you can see on the side it's the size of a size of a uh, quarter yeah, american quarter uh, so uh, so i think that is question again why are we even talking about uh, camera on a phone who's going to use it uh, and now we have this iphone 11 with the uh, uh, the three cameras and whatever have you, and now ca cell phones are known by the cameras that they, that you have. Uh, in almost the, the video or, or the image has become more important than the audio. Nobody cares about how good a sound quality you can get, but what kind of camera do you have? Uh, and by the way, I mean, today we are being able to see uh, and communicate all of this because of this video uh, advance that happened that everybody has, has a camera. And, uh, today's generation actually don't even call it digital camera. It's camera. I mean, they've, they've forgotten that there's such a thing called film camera or CCDs, um, more or less. So today, what we see is that we have got multiple different formats, multiple different sizes, and each of them give you a very different perception of, of, of the image. So you have on one hand um, the, the cell phone camera, that's it. The iPhone now. iPhone, as I said, we have three cameras, and you can do some nifty things with with the, with, with them. Uh, very very tiny. Then you have got your full frame APS-C and the Micro Four Thirds, which are many of the mirrorless cameras that have, that have come about, like the Sony's. Uh, this is where Sony's uh, Sony has done a great progress. So has Panasonic, uh, Fujifilm, and so on. Uh, on the DSLR side, it's still Nikon, Canons. Canons also play a, a very big role in, in the in the in the mirrorless. And then you've got your film camera, which is the S35 or the what I call the ultra uh, full frame, which is bigger than the size of uh, uh, 35 millimeter film. The the, ca the sensor size is bigger than that, and that's where you have Red um, Red Monstro, uh, you have uh, Ari Ari uh, uh, LF. Um, those cameras. And then the even bigger ones, which I'm not going to talk about here, is the medium format cameras, uh, Fujifilm uh, GX05, so I think, that, that's the name of the, of the camera. Um, so how do these things really uh, make a difference to, our, to us? But before that, you know, I want to talk about what is it that when you're looking at a camera, what does a camera have to do? Uh, it sounds trivial, but we have Remember, remind ourselves that it has to have enough details, resolution, more megapixels. We'll come to that. Uh, sensitivity. It has to capture light. It has to be sensitive to light. So how many, how much light to how much signal do you get? Is your sensitivity now? One of the measures is ISO. Well, we'll 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 see that. Field of view. How much of a field of view that do you capture? Uh, and that's where, of course, your lens comes into the picture. Motion. How how well does it does it uh, give you motion? <laughs> Fidelity like is the picture nice, crisp? Is it is it noisy? Uh, does it have artifacts? And this, these are very very big things for when you come to to CMOS image sensors. Uh, very big thing latitude. What's the minimum signal to the maximum signal uh, you can capture? Uh, you know, till the other day, um, even Red One uh, when when we first came out, it had maybe eight to nine stops. Um, you know, one stop is doubling of light. So uh, maybe thousand to one kind of dynamic range, minimum to maximum. Today we are talking about 16, 17 stops, which is same as, as film, uh, maybe even a little bit better than film. Um, color rendering. I mean, you know, most of the things that you do with a with, with camera, most of the time you're actually looking at a person. So how well do you represent that person? There's some, some very interesting, funny things that are happening. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that along the way. And then when we go to high-end cameras, we talk about texture, we talk about softness, we talk about higher highlight roll-off. We will talk about, uh, um, we will um, see all of these things as we go along. All right, but let me, let's, let's take a step back and think about the, the, the weirdness that we, that we, uh, uh, Wait a second. What happened here? Yes, that we uh, that this entire ecosystem of digital camera uh, involves, um, and our people talk about analog. People talk about film, but think about it. 
you start with light. Light is not continuous. Light consists of discrete particles called photons, or at least, well, forgetting about the quantum just for the time being. Uh, we know it's particles because there is something called short noise. We'll come to the short noise in, in, in a bit. But it start with particles, okay, almost like digital. Photon there or not there. That's captured by a, a circular aperture. Hmm? Your lens is circular on a rectangular format. And then in the inside the camera, those photons go into an analog signal. Then the analog signal is digitized. Again, ones and zeros. And then you mani manipulate this ones and zeros. And you send it to, to a, 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 a display. Because ultimately, you have to see the, see the damn, whole damn thing. Which is seen by our eye. That rectangular thing is again seen by a circular thing, which looks at the data in a very discrete fashion. Not in a continuous fashion, even though we think light is continuous, light is not continuous. And ultimately, it's interpreted by the brain. We must remember that, 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 that whatever we see, it's not a passive thing. It's a very, very, very active thing. There are seven centers in the brain that, that a particular image gets processed and fused and um, shown. But the first thing we start off is the light. Now, no light, no imaging. Uh, so that's the that's the, uh, the the ecosystem that that we we are going to be inhabiting for the next uh, hour or couple of hours or so. All right. So what does the sensor look like? If you go into a sensor, well, you can see on the left hand side, there's a picture of an image sensor. Nothing too exciting, but a lot goes into making it. I mean, just to give you an idea. Uh, you know, these, these sensors nowadays are sending out uh, 300 megabits per second. Uh, say if you're shooting at 24 FPS, if you're shooting at uh, higher frame rates, even higher data rates. So that amount of data is pumping in and out. There's billions and billions and billions and billions of electrons that are moving around the sensor. And we are trying to capture one electron. The noise floor of most of our sensors today that are out in the market is good to about an electron. So you can actually see one electron. Why is there an electron? Well, what happens in a, in, a, in a CMOS sensor, as it happens in any image capturing mechanism, is that somehow those photons, the light that came in, is converted into an equ equivalent number of electrons. And we'll see that. So that's it's those electrons that we play with. Um, so. So I just want to give you an appreciation of that. We, while there is this huge amounts of signals that are floating around, we are trying to detect that one electron. All right. We know that all of these sensors have to have color. Now, silicon has a pretty low silicon, which is the material with which all of these things are made of, has a very uh, wide range of spectral response that is in wavelengths, so going from, say, something like 400 nanometers, which is blue, to, to all the way to about a micron. Uh, which is, we cannot even see it. We cannot see much beyond 700 nanometers or so, which is red. Uh, so how do we get color out of it? We get it through this bare pattern. You're familiar with it, but on every pixel, there is a filter that either brings in the red light or the uh, green light or the blue light. I mean, it's not so uh, straightforward. The, the, the red filter uh, also lets in a bit of green. The blue filter not only just brings in blue, it stops the green, but brings a little bit of red as well. So, so don't think of red as red. Don't think of blue as blue. But by and large, uh, each pixel is covered with a red, green, blue filter in a pattern called bear pattern, where there are twice as many greens as the reds and blues. And why? Because our human eye, which is, a, by the way, that, that's an amazing device. Uh, you can't really compare it with an image sensor. Uh, is more sensitive to, to green uh, than to, to the other colors. Most of our uh, sensing, by the way, happens in, the, in a very small region, uh, which is, we call the macula. Uh, within that, the, the, the fovea, which is about a two and, two and a half millimeter kind of size uh, circle. That's where most of your color vision comes from. We have a very wide field of view. We have about uh, 150, 160 uh, field, uh, degrees field of view. And that's all covered by uh, things called rods, which are not sensitive to, to, light, uh, to color at all. 
So all our color vision comes from the center of our eye. Uh, by the way, unlike an image sensor, our eye is constantly moving. So that's why we see this, this, this much wider, this immersion uh, feeling that we have, that we are uh, surrounded by, uh, by things. Uh, it's because our eye is constantly stitching together uh, uh, images, uh, discrete images taken at each time. Um, I, I don't want to go, go get diverted into that. It's, it's a fascinating topic, and that gives rise to a lot of optical illusions as a result. But let's talk. go back to the wavelength. So if you look at a typical imager, you'll see the kind of wavelength, that you, the uh, response that you see here. On the y-axis is sensitivity, on the x-axis is wavelength. Uh, between 400 and 500, it's about blue. Between 500 to 600, it's about it's green. 550 being the sort of the, the, the center part of green, and the red is is about that. Um, so most of our sensors are more sensitive to blue uh, to to green than to red and blue, and a very important part is played by IR cut filters, and we will we'll see that the, the, those IR cut filters is very needed because, as I said, silicon responds long after this. Um, can't show the, the you can't see the, the uh, my my uh, cursor. It, it goes way beyond 700 nanometers. We have to cut that out, otherwise you'll see kind of a fog in your in your in your image. Um, most most sensors that we have today there it has this IR cut filter along with something called a, many of the high end ones at least have this thing called OLPF optical low pass filter, and we'll come to that. All right. Um, one of the major differences between a film and a digital uh, ca camera or a digital sensor, a CMOS sensor, is that a CMOS sensor is inherently linear. So you have these photons come in, then we create with potentials, with electrostatic potentials, something called a bucket, where those photons get converted into electrons and are captured. Silicon converts the photons into electrons, they're captured in the bucket. As a bucket fills up with electrons, you get more or less signal. So when you have very few photons, you have maybe one, two, three electrons created. When you've got a lot of uh, uh, photons, maybe 50,000 electrons are created. All right. So those electrons then are converted into a voltage, a fully analog signal inside each pixel. Remember, there we've got a We've got, let's say, what, 12 megapixel, 18 megapixel, 20 megapixel cameras, like, let's say Red Monster, which is a 32 megapixel camera. <clears throat> uh, in each pixel, this con conversion is happening. And in each pixel, we convert that those electrons into a voltage. So now we've got photons in, and you've got voltages inside the pixel. Now those voltages have to be read out. But there are these 32 megapixels. So there is a very big bus with loads of pixels that are sending its data. And that's, that's all the, the, the technology inside, how we manage that. And then in the end, we have got an A to D converter, which puts, spits out 10 to 16 bits of data. So your photons coming in, which are individual photons, goes into electrons, goes into analog signal, and is gained up uh, because you may have very little signal, let's say 10 electrons of signal, uh, and you've got one volt range. What are you going to do? You're going to gain it up. To, to hit that entire one volt range. But if let's say you've got 50,000 electrons, then you're not going to gain it up. After you have done that, then you convert it into digital bits, ones and zeros, 16 of those, let's say. So a 16 bit, each of them coding a zero or a one, gives you 65, 536 different levels. Okay. So, uh, Immediately, you can see something that's that's very uh, very interesting. That your full well, that is how much that bucket can hold, varies from five thousand electrons or so, which is which is what you get in a in an iPhone like sensor to say fifty thousand electrons, say which you get in an Arri or a or a Red, uh, and you have got sixty five. Uh, when I say fifty k, which is fifty thousand, uh, you have sixty five. 536 or 65k digital levels. So in other words, almost every electron gets mapped to one digital bit. So now you can see that that Y digital works just just fine. You don't have any more resolution. You don't have any more any more resolution in, in the in the in the uh, intensity scale anymore. 
but there are other factors that come in which makes it that even with less than 16 bits you can uh, do your imaging without a problem as i said our noise floor is one or two electrons our full well is about 50 uh, kilo electrons which means that you've got you you spread that between 10 to 15 uh, bits now bits since it's one or zero it goes by factors of two which is very closely res resembles stops when you open up your aperture you give in like going from f 2.8 to f4 you bring in twice the light so there is a very close relationship between the digital numbers and the stops so when you've got 16 bits of data you can code at least 16 bits or 16 stops of signal you can actually code more than that and we'll see that in very very shortly but i want to talk about the comparison between a film and a digital in terms of the responsivity uh, the red curve is shows a film scan um, and what a film inherently does unlike a, a, a cmos image sensors is it's inherently logarithmic and that's very 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 important which is why a film you can throw in light and you never kind of saturate it keeps going it keeps going and going and going like that energizer bunny so that's one of the great things about film that it has this log response uh, which means that your highlights you don't worry about they're not never going to get really saturated but film has a fog at, at low end you need good five six photons for even more for it to respond so which means that uh as you can see from this curve again i can't move my cursor hover my cursor over but at the lower end of the curve a uh, film do not have that good darkness or shadow uh response while a, a digital camera is great shadow response while film has very good protection on the of the highlights while film uh, while digital clips out completely as you can see from the blue cur curve and that kind of tells you a general rule that with a film you never worry about the highlight you want to make sure that your shadows are well exposed with a digital you don't worry so much about the shadows there's a lot there because your noise floor is so low but you have to protect your highlights uh, and this is a general thing that holds but of course different for different cameras but this is this is this is one of the reasons why there has been an explosion of uh, amateur filmmakers which is great because you don't need that much light you don't have to worry about light so much all right but of course no light no good image i'm not saying that you should just go out and crank up your iso and and, and start shooting no that's not what I'm saying, but I'm just telling you why it has happened. Okay, one of the things before I go too far, I, I want to talk about is this thing called rolling shutter. Because remember, there's this 32 megapixels, uh, or in terms of lines, you'd say 8K K, K lines. You have heard about 8K, 4K, 2K uh, displays, which means in, in if you have this rectangular format, in each line, you have got 4,000 pixels, that's a 4K. It's actually not 4,000, it's less than that, but let's say 4,000 pixels, it's, that's called 4K. Uh, in terms of megapixels, that's 4K by say 2K, or if it's 16 by nine, it's a little bit more than 2K. So that's eight megapixels, so 4K, eight megapixels. Now, how do you read all of them out? You have only one port or a few ports to read those data out. So you have to kind of scan it one row at a time. So what happens as a result is that in a CMOS imager, you don't expose all pixels simultaneously more or less in most most sensors that that you see so as you can see from here every row of data gets exposed at slightly different instance of time so take an example say you're shooting at 24 fps which is about 42 milliseconds of uh, every 42 milliseconds a new frame comes in how long do you expose you don't expose for the entire 42 milliseconds so although you can but you don't most film runs on what we call 180 degree shutter, which is half the time. And this is a shutter is a, is, a, is a throwback from the film days when there was actually a mechanical shutter that would move in front of the film, exposing the film. Uh, so 180 degree shutter, which is half the time you're exposing, uh, is, is what we are, we feel comfortable seeing video in. And that's a very important thing uh, that, that you, you'll see. So 
if it's 180 degree shutter, you would be exposing the whole damn thing for each pixel for about 21 milliseconds. But because of this skew, because you cannot read all of them all at once, you read one row at a time, one row of pixels at a time. And each time to read all of those pixels out takes, let's say, some a few microseconds. From the top of the ar array to the bottom, there is a delay. And that delay is, say, let's say, in this case, of the order of seven milliseconds. So you have 21 milliseconds of exposure time, seven milliseconds of this skew, this delay, and 14 milliseconds of, um, of idle time, where your sensor is doing nothing. And that makes up your 42 milliseconds of exposure. So that's your 180 degree shutter. But as a result, what happens is that the top gets exposed earlier than the bottom gets exposed. So now imagine you're moving a straight edge across it. Uh, what you, would you see? The straight edge gets bent. But for most of, the, of our video applications, we don't even really see those, those things. But let me show you that this, the, the, the thing is very real. So let's see if I can stop the slide presentation and then I do, how do I do the sharing again? Um, where is the share button? Screen share on, your entire screen, share, no, no, share. All right, and yeah, there are multiple of this, I know. But here, look at this. Do you see how the, the, the guitar, guitar strings are being bent out of shape? That's not how the guitar works at all. Okay, this is the rolling shutter artifact. Okay, I think you see that. All right, now there are ways of getting around that. And in fact, uh, there are a number of sensors available or actually a few sensors available where you get something called a global shutter where all pixels actually expose for exactly the same amount of time. And that's what you get here. You don't see those artifacts anymore. All of them are behaving like a guitar string would, 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 would do. Except that in most of our cases, we don't really see this problem. As a result, um, most sensors that we have today are um, these rolling shutter sensors, not the global shutter sensors. Sony introduced a, a global shutter sensor, F65, I think, and you know it, uh, the the newer the the latest version after f65 that they have introduced is back a rolling shutter which is the the venice so yeah so so for for most of our applications not a very big deal but uh, if you really want to 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 freeze those motions we can uh, that's 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 the main thing that that take away from here okay let's talk about resolution I mean, we hear about megapixel rays. We use four megapixels, two megapixels, 16 megapixels, what number? As I said, there are two ways of talking about uh, resolution. One is in terms of megapixels, which is not really the right way. Uh, the other way is the number of lines, which is also not the right way. But uh, we are constantly going from HD, which was 19, 20 pixels across. Then we went to 4K, which is some 3,800 or, or camera terms, some 4,096 pixels across. Or 8K, which in television terms is some 7,800 pixels across, but for, for us, it's 8,000 something pixels across. So uh, there are companies that are constantly bringing out uh, sensors with more and more resolution, or rather, or what is billed as more and more resolution, or more and more pixels. Like uh, Sony, I think uh, they, they just introduced um, Alpha 7R4, which is a 61 megapixel. Uh, do you need them? Well, the resolution is definitely there. I mean, here you, you can see between HD, 4K, and 8K. Sure enough, the resolution is there. But do you see it? All right. There was a, I won't go into uh, gory details, but uh, recently there was a study done by Warner Brothers of a 8K versus 4K TV. 8K. 8,000 8, lines or 7,800 lines uh, versus 4,000 lines. And uh, there was a double line study with seven clips, uh, including Dunkirk, including some nature videos. Uh, and here is something you, you see this, uh, you see that even there in Dun Dunkirk, which was clip number one, nobody could see any difference. 
So for most camera film movies, you won't see a difference. But in this nature of uh, shots, most people actually saw it to be slightly better. So even at 8K, there is perceptual difference that's there. But it's such a diminishing return that I will not hold out for that. Uh, but you know, there are people talking about their, their roadmaps of 8K television and so on. Uh, I personally think that definitely going, and I'll show you some of those going from standard de definition to high definition was a huge step up. You immediately saw, saw, the, saw the difference. When you went from HD to 4K, you still see differences uh, to an extent. I am not sure this 8K bit is going to be real, but then I never argue against market. Uh, I mean, we, we thought that uh, oh, nobody will make pixels that are, say, 1.4 micron by 1.4 micron in size. That's the size of your uh, iPhone camera uh, pixel. And we get fantastic images out of it. I wouldn't have thought it possible. So if it's 8K, it's 8K. If you want to spend some more money, we'll spend some more money. But what is a true resolution? Now, resolution is a very interesting term because let's say I take a, 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 a line pattern, dark, bright, dark, bright, like, like you, can, you kind of see here. Now, each of those dark, one dark bright would be called line pair. So let's say I put some, a few line pairs per millimeter of resolution in front of you. Uh, can you see 10 line pairs per millimeter? Can you see 100 line pairs per millimeter? And you immediately ask me, how close to that object am I? Because our uh, resolution is dependent on an angle. So given an angle, as you can kind of see on, 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 on this picture, again, I, this is really irritating that I cannot hover my, uh, uh, my cursor over it. But our resolution is that for a given angle, and ang that's why we talk all about angular resolution, that remains fixed. So for instance, a human eye can differentiate about one arc minute, one sixtieth of a degree. Within that, as you go further and further away, Obviously, your line pairs per millimeter falls. So you can see very close to you, maybe 50 line pairs per millimeter, 100 line, line, line pairs per millimeter. But when you go some 25 centimeter away, which is a standardized distance for testing your eye, you can see about six line pairs per millimeter. That's a, that's a good vision. All right. So the point I'm trying to make is that of, often you hear this line pairs per millimeter. That makes no sense in, in terms of talking about resolution unless you also specify the distance. So human eye has one uh, arc minute of angular resolution. It's about six line pairs per millimeter, 25 centimeter away. All right. And that also tells you something that as these these line pair scales, line pairs per millimeter scales. So as you go further and further away, your size of an object becomes apparent size of the object becomes smaller and smaller because the same angular resolution, which is essential for imaging. That's why uh, somebody far away looks looks uh, smaller. And the other thing that happens is that as you go further and further away, your light from that falls off as a distance squared. So things look fainter and fainter. It also looks more blurry, and we'll come to that depth of focus, which is a very, very key thing in, in any, any imaging systems. So, right, so what kind of uh, um, resolutions do you see? So obviously, it depends upon how far from the, the display are you, for instance, on a TV. Say even a 16-inch TV, you're not going to see it any closer than say 10 feet. Um, for most cases, a laptop about one and a half feet, desktop maybe three feet, smartphone right next to you about a foot away, and a big movie theater you sit maybe 60 feet away. Right? Given that, you can kind of read that. Yeah, there is still room for improvement. The maximum K for a TV, I think, is 4K. Beyond that, you'll never see anything uh, much more beyond that. And today's 2K is probably quite uh, OK. When you go to a movie, that number goes to something like 8K. So there is a lot more room for improvement. And similarly for smartphones, which are, because they're so close by, you can probably uh, see maybe 6Ks of resolution. Now, the only point of making all of this is that yeah, it makes sense, still makes sense to increase the number of megapixels in terms of resolution that we get. But resolution is not everything. And there is a diminishing return in the number of megapixels. 
what really you have to think in terms of, instead of thinking of megapixels, is the format, is the image sensor format. So it's, a, it's as the old saying goes, it's a size that matters. I mean, for us, it started mattering in a different way. For microelectronics, its size matters in the other way. Smaller, the better. It's because every single line became smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, we could actually pack in all these transistors in a pixel, and we could make CMOS image sensors. So, till the uh, till our um, um, uh, technology, the line geometries became down to one micron, half a micron, 0.1 micron kind of range. We could not make these these image sensors. But in terms of our perception, in terms of what we see, it's a size because the total amount of photons you are going to collect is proportional to the area. So larger the size of your sensor, the larger the amount of light that you would be able to deal with. And more light, better the image. And hence, the most important thing you need to ask yourself is not number of megapixels, but the number, what's the size of your image sensor. So here are some of the sizes and, 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 and be familiar with it because, you know, I mean, when you go to buy a camera and you say that, oh, it has 20 megapixels or something that has 40 megapixels, the first thing you, say, you ask is uh, what is the size of your sensor? And there are a few of the more very commonly known formats, like the full frame, which is 36 by 24, uh, APS-C, which is 23 by 16, micro four thirds, which is 17 by 13 and so on all the way down to one over 2.55 inch sensors, which is our uh, iPhone sensors, which is 5.6 millimeter by 4.2 uh, millimeter. And then on the other side, you have the red camera, for instance, which is the ultra uh, uh, full frame, uh, has about the same, num same, same area, but the dimensions are somewhat different. Now, why does this matter? As I said, there are two of these uh, tables you can see. One is called the crop factor. I will not go into the crop factor now, but crop factor essentially is the ratio of the uh, the width of this image sensor, of one image sensor to the other, using full frame as a reference point. So the full frame image sensor width to say the 1.255 inch iPhone camera uh, width is about six and a half. All right. So that's your image. Uh, that's that's what your uh, crop factor is. The other thing is that how much area do you reduce when you, uh, reduction do you get when you go from a full frame sensor to say an iPhone sensor? Well, that's of the order of six and a half squared, something like 37. So in general, your uh, full frame sensor would be 36 times more sensitive than your iPhone sensor. All right. Um, now, one of the things that I want to uh, stop and probably talk about very, very quickly is, uh, maybe I, I will show, show that video later, is digital pan and zoom. One of the big advantage of having more pixels is that you can actually reframe your sensor and can, from a static frame, generate some motions. Or if you're moving, you can come zoom in and make the picture look better. Maybe I'll, I'll just show you. So some of you may not, uh, all right, what do I do? Stop this Stop slide presentation. I rent the screen share. And I go to here. Okay, this is, a, this is showing a straight lock camera thing. Somebody doing a, a very simple uh, move, uh, an action move. Now in post, we zoom in and move the camera in each frame. And this is what you get, a much close up view of the whole action. This is entirely done in post. It's not done on, on, on the field. And this is what extra pixels can get you. And as you will see, it comes closer and closer and closer. So you can actually create almost a close up from a wide shot, comes in handy. I don't recommend it all the time, but sometimes it comes in very, very, very handy. All right, start presentation. Where is it? Where am I? Yeah. Um, all right. So we're talking about the the, uh, the area and the sensitivity, and this is kind of a graph that I have, and this is something that you should keep in mind. 
The x-axis is the number of megapixels, and the y-axis is the sensitivity. It's an approximate number. And what matters is the area of your sensor divided by the number of megapixels, because that gives you your pixel area. The amount of exposure that you're going to be using, exposure time, let's say you're using one um, fortieth of a second or w whatever have you, and the F number. The capital F is the F number. The F number is tells you how much light you are, you are getting in. So smaller the F number, the more light you get in. You go, say, from F2.8 to F4, which is one stop, you double the light. And we'll see that in, in, in one second. All right. So the main thing that I want to take away from this, this slide is that as you increase your number of megapixels, you get lesser and lesser sensitivity. But as you increase your sensor size, total sensor size, you buy that back. So, so for instance, when you compare an iPhone camera, which is a, a 10, 12 megapixel camera, to um, say, uh, what would I say, a, a Panasonic, uh, which is also a 10 megapixel camera, but much bigger format, you get better response. In the same way, if you compare an iPhone, which has 12 megapixels, compared to an ARRI, which, with which you shoot movies, ARRI Mini, for instance, which is about 5 megapixels, that ARRI will be far more sensitive because, because it has more area. So the, I think I've made my point. Think in terms of total area. And this is what you see when you compare a Sony. You know that Sony uh, Alpha 7s, they are very, very good. This mirrorless camera is very, very good in low light. And they have these uh, Alpha 7, Alpha 7S, Alpha 7R. S stands for uh, sensitivity. R stands for resolution. That's, that, that's the way that they look at it. And if you look at a, at a particular branch, for instance, say uh, Alpha 7S3 and Alpha 7S, uh, Alpha 7R3, you see the S3 has way smaller number of pixels than R ha Rs have. The pixel sizes are almost double of each other. That's why you get lesser number of pixels on the same size, because all the Alpha 7s are full frame sensors, OK, 36 by 24, approximately. <laughs> and that's what you see here, that when you compare the sensitivities, and this is called a Zyla chart, where each bar is has a reflectivity that is half of the previous bar. So the bar on the left uh, has twice the reflectivity of the bar on the, the second, the second is twice the reflectivity of the third, and so on. So when you expose a Zyla chart all at once, you see your entire gamut or entire latitude of your film. And, and you see what happens, that the, the, the Alpha 7Ss hold up in dark very, very well. You can see the right-hand side. It's, it's very, very well. You don't have a uh, appearance of noise, while the Alpha 7Rs pretty soon lose that ability. So you're trading resolution for low light sensitivity. And I would pick up low light sensitivity any day over resolution. All right. So now a very few quick things. I mean, most of you probably are familiar with exposure triangle. Uh, for, for those that are not, I'll very briefly go over it, that you have three things with which you control light. One is your aperture. Uh, that's on the left, which is which is where your f1.4, f2.8, all of these terms come. Um, the f1.4 essentially means that your aperture is such that is uh, the, the the focal length of a diameter is uh, 1.4. All right. So as you close the shutter more and more, uh, you get less and less amount of light. You change something else as well, which is will go in the depth of field, but since we are talking about light, you can go one stop, that is go from say f1.4 to f2, and you will double your light. So essentially, let's say you go from f2.8 to 5.6, how much more light would you get? Well, uh, divide the two ratios, 2.5.6 uh, divided by 2.8, square it, that's amount more amount of light you would have when you're at f2.8. Okay. Of course, shutter speed, if you go longer and longer in exposure, you'll see more and more light. No no magic there. In fact, in astronomy, you go uh, for uh, hours because you're looking at such faint objects. 
um, not not milliseconds, which is what where we are we are operating. We are operating in 24 frames per second, which is like uh, 21 milliseconds. Uh, but in astronomy, you go to maybe even hours. There are lots of other issues, but I'm not suggesting we do that. But exposure, more light. The other is ISO. Now, ISO, as I mean, any of you who have used a digital camera, you turn up the ISO, things look brighter. But here is the most important point to remember that ISO does not change sensitivity. Your sensitivity of your sensor is governed by that bucket that you've created. That's where by the bucket that you've created and by how you convert those electrons into a voltage. Remember the photons came in, created electrons, electrons will give rise to a voltage. Well, it's in that, that process of, of transformation from photon to electrons is your sensitivity. And then from electrons to your voltage is your sensitivity. That's, that's it, that's fixed. You are not going to touch that in any sensor. You cannot change that. Well, there are these dual ISO sensors which change the, the essentially the ratio of how you convert from electrons to for electrons to a voltage inside the pixel. You choose that ahead of time. But by and large, uh, once you choose a sensor, your ISO is fixed. I mean, that's the wrong thing to say. Your sensitivity is fixed. What and okay, here are the few uh, equations. I'll just go over it very, very quickly. When we are comparing images or, or light, we want to see per unit area, how much light came in. That's what your light measure, light meter is measuring. That's a flux, photons per unit area. And that goes about the L, which is the luminosity, the, the luminance that, that you're applying, how much light you're applying. Are you putting a uh, 1,000 watt or are you putting a 100 watt uh, light? How far away? Uh, that's your luminance. Exposure time divided by F number squared. And because of this exposure time divided by F number squared, we call that an EV. One EV means equivalent amount of light. So as long as you have the same uh, uh, exposure value or EV, you get same amount of light. So you increase your F number by, by one stop, your exposure value goes up by, by one stop. Um, so, and along with that, you have got your ISO which essentially tells you in an, an in a CMOS image sensors how much you brighten. So, and so here is an example. Uh, what is remaining fixed is your sensitivity of your sensor. If you choose the same F number, you choose the same exposure, same light, nothing changes. All you're doing with the ISO knob is to make it brighter and brighter. So here is an example. Look at the, the, uh, the, gra uh, the picture on the left. Uh, your, this, this, the, the, the line shows you how much light is coming in, this, in the picture. With those red bars, you're picking up a certain portion of that and you're mapping it to your sensor. Okay. Now, if you're in a dark situation, you would not have mapped all the way to your sensor. Your sensor may have one volt of range and you, you may have mapped only to 200 millivolts of that. But your display then would look dark, right? So what you do is that you add a gain, either analog gain or digital gain. And what happens, that, that's good, right? I mean, I've got 200 millivolts of signal. I've got my whole range was one volt. I can gain it up by four times. No problem to, to get the same kind of brightness of, of the image, except that at the bottom, you have got this digital noise. And you multiply this noise as well. And that's why if you take the same sensor, same lighting level, same F number, same exposure, and you just crank up the ISO, your picture looks noisy. Right. So there is no substitute to getting good amount of light in getting good picture. However, as I said earlier, that the most digital sensors today have got very, very low noise. So you've got a lot of detail in the shadows. So if you haven't exposed properly, even by as much as a stop or maybe two stops, you can recover. So let's say you're, you're on a shoot or you're, you're, you're in, a, in a situation where there is not enough light, as much light as you needed. Let's say it's off by factor of four, so two stops. So it's two stops darker than where you needed it to be. Can you in post-processing by cranking up the ISO, say from 800 to, uh, 3200 four times 
could you uh, get back your image, get a decent quality image? Yeah, most of the sensors today at 3200, I mean, I'm talking about, certainly I'm talking about uh, movie sensors, like the, like the Red or uh, Ari or, or uh, uh, Arsa Mini or uh, Venice. You crank up by two to even maybe three stops, you are okay. You go more than that, you are in problem. So yeah, you have more latitude now, latitude in, in terms of more uh, possibilities in terms of what you can do, but uh, but no, I mean, you can't, you can't do everything. Well, I think I need to speed up. I'm going way too slow. Um, Now, a very, very important thing that I want to talk about is the digital noise. One of the things that you see, one of the most ugly things, uh, as I said, the, the, the noise is very low, but one of the ugly things about this digital noise is that it's colored. And why? Because remember the bear pattern, you have this red, green, blue. So take a blue pixel. In this blue pixel, you have no green data. You have no red, red data, really speaking. So what we do is that after the the image is captured on the blue we go and interpolate so it reduces your resolution to some extent but more importantly in the blue pixel by looking at the red pixels next to it the four red pixels next to it you get the red value and looking at the four green pixels next to it you get the green value right so in each pixel the blue pixel you generate an rgb value red green blue value similarly for the green pixel you get an rgb value as a result of doing that, and because the responsivity of each of the channels are different, your color becomes red and blue because those are the two signals that were low in sensitivity. So you have to gain it up more. So your color, the noise is not neutral, it is colored. And that is ugly. Uh, the other uh, thing that you see in a, in a digital image sensor often is structured noise, where you see uh, the noise is not random, but there is a, uh, there's a structure on, on top of it. Um, and the other thing that, that's there is short noise, which is that at any light level, you always have noise associated with it. This is very much, very unlike audio, where you can get a clean audio signal without any noise. There is a noise at the bottom. But in a photon, there's something called short noise, where if you collect, say, 1,000 electrons, all right, there is an uncertainty of square root of 1,000 or 33 on top of it. So let's say you've got a, got a, a steady source and you read it again and again and again and again. And every time you go back and measure what the, what's the number, you will not see that every time it's the same number. It's going to be different each time. So on an average, maybe you have, you have, you have captured 1,000 electrons, 1,000 photons. Let's say photon to electron conversion is unity. You will see that every time from one frame to another, you've got a variation that's of the order of plus minus 33 electrons. This is a short noise. So even when you're a well-exposed light, all right, say, say about 800 ISO, how much does it uh, correspond to? Typically, 800 ISO number is set at about 1,000 electrons for, for I'm talking about movie cameras, all right, which means that you've got a 33 to 1 signal to noise ratio, and that's good enough. Once your signal to noise ratio goes above 25 to 1, you get a pretty decent image. All right, so that's something that, that you should keep in mind. Um, OK, time to show you something uh, more again. Now, digital noise is not necessarily a problem. There are lots of softwares available to get rid of that. Now, you can see the left and the right, the, the digital image, the digital noise can be cleaned up. Now, here is something I want to point out. The digital noise is different from, from film grain. Remember, the film also has a, has a, has a, has a grain, struck grain look. It's not flat everywhere. It's kind of uh, different from one place to another. But here, what you see is that the noise is not the same in every frame. In every frame, the noise is somewhat different. And that's what's the most irritating part. OK, all right, so I, I think I, I made my point that, um, uh, oh boy, oh, wait, let's do this. Um, that the difference between film grain and digital noise 
are two major things. Number one, the digital noise is varying from one frame to another. So in the background, you're seeing this constant change and your eye is irritated by it. Grain, on the other hand, which means the response varies from one pixel to another. So a flat patch will have some variation, some structure built onto it, but the structure is random and is fixed. While digital noise varies from one frame to another and has a physical structure. So what you want for good imaging is that the noise that you get or sort of this, this imposed grain that you get has to be random and fixed from one frame to another. So it doesn't move, but it gives you the sense of texture. Our eye like, dislikes flat regions. So the texture is, is important. But what the digital camera does is exactly the opposite, where it varies from one frame to another, and it is colored and often has structures built onto it. So here is an example on, on the left-hand side, you, you see the, the, the film grain, which, shows up in the flat areas you can see there, there is a grainy look which kind of gives you a sense of texture but it's fixed from one frame to another unlike a digital camera picture which has got this colored look and it will vary from one frame to another and that's that's what makes uh, such a such a big difference now let's talk about this thing called the video look what is a video look well video look has has undergone lots of changes first of all in the early days there were the, the the image sensor resolution was very small. Uh, the number of bits were very small. So you have this blocky look that you can see, or the colors were didn't have that much of variation in it. You can look at this picture and say, yeah, this is, this is old. I don't like it. So it's pixelation, not enough dynamic range, not enough latitude between the bright and the and the dark, not enough color resolution. Colors were saturated and crunchy. So red is red and 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 Orange is orange and blue is blue. As it is a very poor skin tones. And uh, the other was that everything was in focus. Okay. So this is the video look that we want to actually get away from. Um, that spatial resolution issue has been taken care of. Now, look at this. This is 480p. We do, very often, you even still now see pictures, uh, videos in that. This is 720. This is 1080p, which is your 2K resolution, almost uh, 1920. Uh, and then you have got your 4K Ultra HD. And just look at this picture and you can see that when you had the 480p, the resolution was so poor that you didn't like it. You said that video look, video sucks. By the time you go to the 180p or the HD, things are pretty good. And then you go to 4K and you see how beautifully uh, things are rolling off. And I, I should I should point out here something that's, that's very important. Um, is that one of the things about film is that, or, or, a, or a high quality image look is that there is a difference between detail and sharpness. Detail means, are you seeing the textures? Are you seeing the lines on somebody's face? But the sharpness means that, is it like completely black and white or is it softly rolling off? And that's what you need, that you need lower contra contrast in whenever you've got some kind of a detail, but you want to preserve that detail. I, I hope it's clear. It's a very, very important thing. Because very often what, what you do is in order to bring in detail, you turn up the contrast. That is, turn, turn up the, uh, the gain between two adjacent pixels. And that's what gives you sharpness. So an edge is a very sharp edge. It's like a cliff. Nothing in the world is like a cliff. Even an edge of an object is not an edge of an object. If you look at it closely, you'll see that it kind of gradually falls off. So what you want is you want to capture all the details. So that's where you need your megapixels. On the other hand, the things have to be such that it slowly falls off. Uh, it does not fall off sharply. And that's where what the difference between sharpness and, and, and detail is. Though very often, we are fooled into thinking that sharpness is detail. Very often, to give you the sense of, of, of more detail, you turn up the sharpness. And that's a very, very uh, bad thing. All right, so now resolution is under control, but we still have this, what I call sitcom look. Uh, this is from one of my favorite TV shows, The Big Bang Theory. Love the show. Whenever I'm depressed, I turn this on to 
set me at ease. Uh, it's one of the things I do. Uh, but you look at these pictures. Everything from the you know the closest object to the mo to mother-in-law who's not even in the in this frame is in focus. Look at these two guys. It's a romantic moment. You wanted to isolate them from the background, but the background is just as sharp as them. And this is the, the look that we are trying to get away from. In other words, what you would like to do is you want to have them in focus and the background kind of recede in the background, either by being blurry or by being making it softer. And the skin tones are better, but everything is kind of crunchy. Uh, the colors are all kind of saturated. So what you want, the, what the film look is, is a slightly desaturated colors, very nice, gentle roll off. There is a creaminess to it. So let me show you what I mean. It's it's a, it's better explained. Here is a lovely, lovely. Um, uh, okay, hold on. I have to first stop the presentation. Then I have to do turn the screen on, share, and I go to this. Okay, okay. It's the the. It's a kind of a giveaway. The, the title is kind of a giveaway. But look at this this picture. I mean, I, let me start it actually from the beginning. You see the scene? There's a lot of brightness, a lot of darkness. That's a latitude. You want to capture all of that brightness and that darkness. And we can't see anything. We can't see anything. We, 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 can't, we, we can't, can't see, see you anything? only. OK, maybe I have to run it. Can you see it? No. How funny? You are visible only. Wait, that's how is that possible? I have a screen share is on, and I go and play this movie now. No, oh. uh, the band plays. Okay, let me stop sharing. Turn it on. Maybe it's too dark for you. I don't know. Can you see it now? No, just we can see you only. We can't see the film. So are you saying that in VLC maybe you cannot see it? No. Last one also we couldn't see only the sound we could. Listen. Oh wow. That is uh, yeah. that's a bummer. No, now the sound is coming. That's a real uh, okay. Let me take two minutes and maybe I want to show it in a quick time and maybe that would show it. Yeah. Uh, give me just two minutes. I'll, I'll convert all of these into. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll make sure that they play with quick time. Uh, open this. Can you see it now? No. Is it a bandwidth issue then? Oh boy. Uh, no, 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 sir. Uh, uh, please turn on uh, screen share first. Oh, I maybe I maybe I didn't turn. Oh yeah, I sorry, I didn't turn on the screen share. But let's see now. Uh, screen share was on. Let's play. Um, I'll play it with quick time now. Yeah, we can see it, sir. So I think it's a quick time. If I play it with VLC player, you cannot see it. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe. No okay, issue. I'm sorry. So then the previous uh, uh, previous one also you didn't see it. I'm sure. No. Uh, okay, maybe I'll I'll show the the point I was making very very quickly. I'll, 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 um... Wrong thing. Uh, shoot, these are all. Okay, here is a. You can see this. Can you see it now? No. Still no. No. Yes, we can see. You can see. Ha. Huh. This okay, is is the noisy picture on the left and the filter on the right. But I can see it. Can you see this now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So this is what I was, being, I, I was talking about. That when you when you play this, what you see is that on the left hand side there's a noisy picture which is which changes from. Um, one frame to another. That was a point I was making, which you couldn't see. But okay, now can you see the uh, the image that's on my on my screen? 
Yes? Anybody? No, I cannot see it. Devan, you can see it. You can play answer, please. I cannot see anything except uh, Vedabrata's face. How funny. Uh... Okay, Debayan, can you see it? I cannot see. You cannot see it? No. How strange. I don't know what to do with it. Oh boy, this is going to be okay uh, problem. But I think I think that uh, people, uh, everybody can see. Oh, you can continue, no problem. Uh, there may be some problem with my computer. Everybody can see. The audience is telling that they can see it. You continue, okay, please. Okay, all right. Then I'll continue with it. All right. So the point I was making is that you see, look at this this frame, and you see this dot. This is uh, has got very bright areas in the in the back. You see something through the window. Very dark areas, and all of them beautifully falls in. When you look at the face, you are not seeing any harsh. Um, you know, contrast between between the sides of the face. Everything is, has a smooth, creamy look. So let me stop speaking and you watch it. This is the film look. Like you see on the on the through the uh, window, huge amounts of light was coming, and wait, the guy is almost in silhouette now. You come into the light, so. And there's a lot of light, and all of them falls in very, very, very beautifully. And also, the other thing I want to point out is that I, this was this is actually a, a, a footage from Steve uh, uh, Yedlin, who was the the DP for Star Wars, and he created this footage. And uh, to show uh, right now, there is not a whole lot of difference between digital and film. One of them is a digital camera, Alexa, and one of them is film. I bet none of you, and if I take a poll, there would be 50-50 as to, to say which is film and which is digital. But that's not the point here. The point here is the look. You, you see the look that how beautifully everything falls off uh, on this person's face, including the edge light that, that, that it picks up. And this gr dreamy yet a lot of uh, uh, signal from uh, from from darkness to to brightness, as well as lots of detail. You see the the imperfections on this person's face, on the beard. All of them shows up. That's what is called holding the detail, as well as having this soft uh, look. Okay, so I hope uh, most people got to see it. Uh, here off. Presentation stuff. Okay, so that's the, the sitcom look that we want to get away from. Uh, we talked about the movie looks. Now, what how you do this is one of the one of the key elements is the depth of field control. I mean, look at the picture on the left top, which is everything pretty much is in focus. While you go to the one on the right, where you blur away the background. And your foreground shows up. And that's what you do in an image, in, in, in a movie, where you want your characters to pop out from the background because you are going to draw the focus of your audience to the drama, to what's happening between one or two, two uh, people, or maybe three, four, people, however you have it. You go to a close up because you want to draw attention to their inner world. In order to do that, uh, I have joined the room. I was outside the room all this time. I don't know. Um, you want to draw attention to, to, your, to your objects, to their inner world. You want to separate them. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. We can okay. hear it. All right. Um, so in order to do that, what you want to do is to control your depth of field. Does not, it doesn't mean that you always have this kind of a depth of field on the right. Sometimes you want to have see everything in focus. So let's say you're establishing a scene where you want to uh, put the context between your 
uh, your um, uh, subjects and the background. You want to show where they are. Uh, for that, you want a deep depth, depth of focus. Everything needs to be in focus. When you go to the drama, you want to go to, to, these, two, to, to these two people or one person, and you just want to separate them from the background. Uh, and so, so controlling the depth of field is very key for your storytelling. Uh, the one on the, on, the, on the bottom shows how distracting these lights in the background are, but when you defocus them, you turn into something beautiful called bokeh. And that gives you beauty. Uh, so whenever you are establishing a shot, what you want to do is that you want to move your camera. You want to show where your subject is with respect to their surroundings, with respect to their context. You want to keep everything in focus. As you move your camera, maybe you, you go to a defocus where you get this bokeh, which gives you this beautiful feeling, because you want, want to feel good as, as, as an audience, or not, depending upon your story, of course. Um, and then you come closer to the object, to, to your subject. When you come closer to your subject, you want to see only their subject. You want to see their eyes. You want to see their face. So controlling this depth of field is something that's so important for filmmaking. And, and, and digital camera, with all its formats, is causing a lot of problem in, in that area. Now, what I mean by depth of focus here, look at this picture on, on, the, on the top. OK? The picture on the top, the same person, same distance from the camera. One of them is done, uh, well, actually, it's not the same distance. The dis distance has also been changed. But one is shot with a uh, longer uh, focal length, 135 millimeter, the other with a shorter focal length, 28 millimeter. And you see in the 28 millimeter, everything is kind of in focus, or at least you see a lot of the background. In the, in the uh, longer uh, focal length one, you don't see anything in the background. It's, it's, it's diffused out. That's your depth of focus, that you're focused only on this person and nothing else. You see the same thing here, the shot in uh, 24 millimeter, 100 millimeter. You see the background is two things. The background is more visible in the 24 millimeter, and it's kind of far away. So on the other hand, in the 100 millimeter, the background is blurred, but it's kind of riding on top of your subject. That again gives you the sense of the, the feeling that something is looming. So these are all the uh, the perceptions that you create by by using these uh, different focal lengths, different f-stops, different distance to your subject. But I, I wonder if you notice something else in the bottom picture, in the bottom picture as I, I was talking about. Uh, and you can see this here, that the pers same person uh, shot with four different lenses. And you see what's happening to the face. In a 24 millimeter, the face has become narrow and kind of popping out. The nose is bigger. And on the 100 millimeter one, the face is flatter. And it's more like the look that we are, we are used to seeing. Now, is this face distortion due to focal length? Most people will tell you that it is, but it is not. It's everything to do with, and I cannot show it to you right now. That will take me a long time. But it's not the focal length, but your distance from the subject. The further you go from, from the subject, the uh, more distorted, uh, uh, more flatter it would look. So the 100 millimeter shot you take from a distance, the 24 millimeter wide angle shot you take from, from close up to the person. And closer you go, your, the more distorted your face is going to be. Now, this is a very funny, funny thing that has happened. With the selfie uh, camera, with all the Instagram and, and so on, you take pictures from pretty close by. And your face gets distorted, and your nose looks bigger. So actually, a person went for a nose job after seeing his selfie. <laughs> and, and poor guy was so wrong, because it's not his nose that was perhaps long. Maybe his nose was long to begin with. But the nose looked, looked bigger because he was so close to, 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 uh, to the display. And, and, and this, this is a very important thing, thing to, to keep in mind, that the, the distortions that happen is not to, to do with the focal length, but your, your distance to the object. And sometimes you might want the distorted look. Sometimes you want to shoot close-ups in, in a, in a, in a uh, wide angle lens because you want to create the distortion. One great way this is used in a shot called dolly zoom, but I, I don't want to get into that here. That's, that's a different uh, case. Now, 
which of the sensors, a big sensor or a small sensor, will have shallower depth of field? Now, you've heard this term often that, oh, uh, we are going into bigger and bigger sensors, and that those give you shallower depth of field. But is that correct? Well, look at this picture. Here is a picture taken with a full frame versus a micro four thirds. Full frame was a micro four third crop factor, or the, uh, the difference in size, or the ratio of the size in, in the horizontal direction is about two to one. Same length, same aperture, same distance, same everything except sensor size. And when you've done that, the smaller sensor, the micro third, four thirds, has shallower depth of field. Look at the two pictures. You will not tell me that the picture on the left, which is the bigger sensor, has shallower depth of field. You will not, right? So it's good news for iPhone sensors. Like so iPhone sensors should give you very shallow depth of field, except that you know anybody who's shot on, on, on the smartphones that it doesn't. So what the hell is going on? But right off the bat, distance same, same aperture, same lens, uh, just going from a larger sensor to a smaller sensor appears to increase uh, appears to reduce your depth of field, gives you a very shallow depth of field. All right. It should be the other way around. Well, you notice one thing that has happened is that your image has come much, much, much closer. Okay, your field of view has changed. And here is some equations. Uh, the depth of field actually depends upon a number of things. It depends upon your aperture. If you close your aperture, say an f11 or f f16 versus a wide open aperture, say f1.4, the angle at with which the rays are, are hitting your sensor are closer. Are that angle changes? So when you're at f1.4, it comes in at a very wide angle. When you're at f11, it comes in at a very shallow angle. As a result, your relative error is much larger when you come at a wider angle, and therefore your depth of field a region over which everything remains in focus is much bigger. The depth of field is much bigger when you go to uh, 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 F11, F16. Okay. Uh, you open your aperture, you go to F1.4, F2.8, your depth of field becomes shallower. But that's not the only thing that, that, that controls it. Focal length controls it. Uh, one, one more thing that controls it is circle of confusion. The depth of field essentially means that not everything is in focus, but even if it's a little bit out of focus, it's OK, as long as your eye cannot tell. And that's your circle of confusion. Now, that circle of confusion obviously depends upon what the final size of your image is going to be. If you take an image that's shot on your cell phone and you're viewing it on cell phone, the circle of confusion can be much bigger because you're viewing at a, at a, at a uh, uh, much closer to you on a, on a much smaller uh, platform. Versus if you want to blow it up and you're going to see it in the movie theater. When you're seeing it in the movie theater, your circle of confusion to start with must have been very small because after you magnified it so much so many times, you are going to see it if things were not in focus. So what you can get away if you don't magnify it too much in the display versus if you magnify it a lot in the display, say between a cell phone screen versus a movie theater, your circle of confusion changes. And that's this B term. That's a circle of confusion, all right? So if you choose to say that I have the full frame sensor and the cell phone sensor, for instance, you're going to see it on the same kind of uh, screen, then as the sensor size becomes smaller and smaller, this number becomes smaller and smaller. You need to have this number smaller and smaller. The depth of field depends upon the distance to the object. As the distance to the object becomes closer, your depth of field becomes uh, shallower. It depends upon your focal length. As you go to longer and longer focal lengths, your depth of field becomes shallower. So you open up your aperture, that is F, low f-stop, uh, wide open aperture, f1.4, depth of field reduces. If you use a smaller sensor, your B term, the circle of confusion, reduces. The distance to the object, as you go closer and closer, your depth of field reduces. And when your focal length of your, of your lens is increased, your depth of field reduces. All right. This is what is at play. Now, how does that resolve the problem that we were talking about? Um, what happens is that when you go to a small lens, or a small format sensor, as I said, this 
this B turn, the circle of confusion has to become very small in order to produce an acceptable image. Now, if you fix everything else, distance to the object, focal length, and uh, focal length and your and your f f stop number, your depth of field becomes uh, uh, shallower, and that's exactly what we saw in the picture earlier. That the depth of field becomes shallower as you went to a smaller sensor, but that's not how you would be uh, watching it. You want to compare it for the same field of view. Remember here the field of view changed. Here, the field of view is much smaller than the field of view here. If you compare the same with the same field of view, uh, what would you get? Well, let's let's see that. Uh, let's actually show that visually. OK. Again, I'm going to show, an, uh, uh, I'm going to show a, a camera. I hope you guys can see it, because uh, if you can't, uh, OK, turn the screen. Share and here goes. Open it with QuickTime. Okay, so we're going to compare three cameras: Canon 5D, which is a full-frame sensor, a 7D, and a Olympus a 7D, which is a, a APS-C, and a and an Olympus, which is a micro four thirds. Here goes. So here is a, a picture of of the image. 100 millimeter uh, lens, f2.8, things are blurred out, all good. Go to 7D, APS-C, again, same, yeah, uh, good. But now you compare side by side. What do you see? You see that with the Canon 7D, with the same uh, focal length, same distance to the object, field of view has changed. And as a result, your background is looking more blurry on the right than on the left. That's exactly what we saw earlier. Okay, here all you have done is that you have moved, kept the distance the same, and you uh, uh, switched one camera to the other, swapped one camera for the other. And the smaller sensor has lower depth of field. Now you go to the next one. Uh, now you go to Olympus uh, Micro Four Thirds. And you immediately see when you go to the 100 millimeter lens on that same distance to the object how much closer they are. So the field of view has changed, and, and the background is even more blurry. One more thing that has happened in, in all of these cases is that the brightness has also changed. And why? Because it's a full frame sensor. This is an APS-C. This is a micro four thirds. So there is a factor of two difference in size, or four in area, from the left to the, uh, uh, to the right. And as a result, the one on the right, which is a smaller area, has uh, is, look, is looking darker. All good. Now, how do you buy back? So the crop factor. Now, in order to get the same field of view as the 100 millimeter uh, lens on the micro four thirds, on the Canon 5D, I have to increase my focal length by a factor of two. And now, both my images have approximately the same field of view. And now, see what has happened. The one on the left now has shallower depth of field. So as soon as you have got the two uh, field of views same, the bigger sensor has shallower depth of field. So the point is that if you're keeping your field of view the same for your all your sensors, the larger the sensor is, the shallower would be the depth of field. Of course, you can uh, correct for it pretty easily or balance balance for it pretty easily. And the way you do it is to cut down the f-stop on the uh, larger sensor. So in I think, let me stop it here. Uh, here, it's at, I've stopped the bigger sensor down, and now both of them look about the same. Oh, look. This is before, and this is after. Before, after, oops. This is after, before, and before, after, before, after. So you see that by change, cutting down the f-stop, now both of these images are looking about the same brightness. This is the ISO also has to be changed, and the background looks the same. Now, have I confused everybody? I don't know if I've confused everybody, but 
here is the point. The point is that as you change your size of your sensor, you have to make sure that you change your focal length by keeping the same field of view. And once you do that, you have to also cut down the f-stop on, uh, on the larger sensor in order to match the same uh, depth of field, as well as the smaller sensor needs to have a lower ISO because it's losing light like a ton. So that's the bottom line. What's the impact of this? The impact of this is the following. The impact of this is here. Is that when you compare an iPhone to, a, say, a Canon 5D, you look at this. In the, in the iPhone, everything, all the way in the background is in focus. While in the Canon, the background is kind of blurry. And that's what you get. That with iPhone type of imaging, it becomes so much more difficult, difficult to control your depth of field. Uh, let me not uh, stay on this. But in iPhone, there is something interesting that has come up, uh, at least in, 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 uh, in uh, still camera mode. And that's called uh, Focus app. What it does is that in the camera, since there are three cameras, one of the cameras you can use to measure depth between the objects. So let's say the depth between here and the background, which is where there's this, this picket fence. Once I know the distance, digitally, I can introduce blur because I know the exact equations. And, as, and this is what you've done in focus. Completely digitally, afterwards, I can dial in a different kind of a blur. It's the same thing here. You change where you focus. You start with, a, with an image that is fully in focus and you choose where you want to focus afterwards. This is what the focus application uh, gives you. Um, by the way, iPhone actually nowadays producing beautiful uh, shots. And uh, maybe, maybe I'll show you, show, show you one of these. I mean, I probably have seen it, but here is something. Uh, here is an. This is an iPhone shot. Look at it. It's beautiful. Looks beautiful to me. I mean, it's it's perfectly fine for for amateur photography, uh, amateur videos, uh, stuff that's going to look at this. This is a beautiful shot. That that would go in 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 YouTube or or you know uh, maybe not for making movies, but it's good enough for many 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 other purposes. Um, so yeah, so uh, so iPhones are are good, but so where's the what did I do? All right. Um, so a few things about shooting with iPhones. A couple of things that you you gotta get. Uh, one is an ND filter. Uh, when you shoot outdoors, you will find that without an ND filter, nothing will look filmic, and and we can go into that in, in discussion if anybody talks about it. Wants to talk about it. Second is get some kind of a gimbal to stabilize your camera. Uh, the one dead giveaway of an amateur photography is or amateur movies when things are moving around. And that's where a gimbal comes in very handy. Third is a fog machine. <clears throat> Remember, you want to create this diffused light, which is what the thing about a film is. And that's where a cheap fog machine will do. And fourth is uh, something called a DOF adapter. Well, that's a very, very interesting thing that has come out of. A DOF adop ad adapter is a lens kind of you add on top of the, the of your image sensor. And what it does is that it's a lens with a some kind of a, a screen at the back. And it's a lens that projects an image on that screen. And it's that screen that is imaged by, by the, uh, the sensor. Now, this lens now can have any kinds of depth of field because now this, this lens can, you can change the f-stop and so on and so forth. And that's what would be imaged by your by your camera, by your iPhone sensor. Remember, the iPhone sensor itself is 12 megapixels, nothing to write, you know, nothing to scoff. Uh, it has decent levels. It's got some good 10, 11 stops of dynamic range. 
So you can get a decent image as long as there is enough light. So if you can change the, the lens in front of it, which you do with this DOF adapter, you can get very shallow depth of field images. I mean, let me show you. Uh, here is something. Oh, I don't, don't want to show it like this. Uh, Here, do you see how diffuse the background is? How blurred the background is? In a regular iPhone movie, you'll never be able to do this. And you do it with this uh, depth of field adapter. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really funky, nifty kind of thing. I mean, it works when there is enough light. It will not work in, in, in dark. But when you're shooting outdoors, you can use it for to, to a really, really, really good end. It doesn't cost that much. but uh, really quickly turns your, your iPhone camera to a pretty decent video source for outdoors in bright light. All right. Um, where do I go from here? Where is it? Where am I gone? I can't trace. Huh. I'll stop sharing. Uh, okay. Uh, and also, uh, by the way, get, get a Filmic Pro type of app, which will allow you to change your the focal length and so on. I'm going to skip through this, this slide. Um, basic shooting techniques is that you what you want to do is you want to protect your highlights. Whenever you're shooting with even, even with a DSLR, even with this mirrorless cameras, they don't have enough range, enough dynamic range, like latitude of 14, 15 stops, as a film would give you. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that your highlights never blow out. Um, you don't forget to don't don't be afraid of looking into into a light. Look at the, the the picture here. Looking into the light in the back gives you some beautiful uh, bokeh. Use diffusers and use a fill light to to light up your 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 your, your subject. Never underestimate light. Light is a very very important thing. It's your biggest 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 friend. So in digital, as I say, protect your highlights. Forget, don't worry so much about your uh, shadows, and shoot flat profile. What do I mean by flat profile? A flat profile means that instead of having a linear signal coming out of it, you remember that these sensors are all linear sensors. You would what comes out of it has an input-output characteristics of a log. So if your signal went linearly on the x-axis. In the y-axis, what you output is a log. It's a fake thing. It's, it's not that your sensor is behaving in a log way, as a film does. Your sensor is still linear, but digitally, you put a, a flat profile on top of it. So contrast is gone. Everything looks, uh, looks ugly. Uh, but nothing goes out of range. So that's a way, when you shoot, you make sure that nothing is clipped, nothing is too dark. Nothing is too bright. And then you can use what is called a LUT. You must have heard this term LUT, uh, which is a, uh, I mean, I was very disappointed when I learned what a LUT is. It's lookup table. I tell you this technologist. Um, but uh, using this LUT, you can recover back everything. What you have done in the process is that you made sure that while you're shooting, you never go out of range. You never clip, nor do you overexpose. But there is another very important thing for, for this log, but I'll come to that. What the lookup table does is that you start with a log, you apply some kind of a curve on top of that, which you do for each color separately, for the red channel, green channel, blue channel, and where you might want to suppress the darks and you want to suppress the brights and you want to highlight where your subject is, which is where your skin tone is going to be. Um, I mean, even if you look, uh, look at me, you can see that I have been wearing this black shirt uh, in the background, there's some light leaking. My camera is not that good. This, this light is kind of fully blown out. You want to see some of these. these. And that's what your log has done. And then you apply a, a curve on top of that, and you get your uh, beautiful picture. Except that your system is now nonlinear. It's no longer A plus B equal to C. Remember that this good, good. 2AB term, which we were told. My Canadian friends will know what I'm talking about very well. The 2AB term. So things are nonlinear because you start with a, with a logarithmic curve. 
which means that when you add A plus B, it's no longer C. It's something else. Uh, it's perhaps best to show it in picture. Look at the, the situation here after you have applied a lot. And what you can see on the picture on the left top is that the sky is no longer really blue. Everything is, has kind of red in it. Right now, I want to fix it. So I turn up the, the, the curve on the blue channel somewhat more. So and my, my sky is fixed. This is where one did like it. But look at what happened on the face. On the face, instead of that, that red ruddiness that, that you had, it's become cooler. It becomes more blue. That's not good. So can you get either this or that and nothing more? And that's where 3D LUT comes in, which is a three-dimensional LUT where you, depending upon your intensity, you change the values of your red, green, blue. So red, green, blue are not moved independently of each other. Depending upon the content of red, you would move the blue. So when you've done that, now you hold your blue skies as well as the ruddiness on your face. Because what you've done with the 3D LUT is that wherever there is a red signal, red, red pixel or, or redness in, in the scene, you're not going to add the blue. And that's where your nonlinearity comes in. But wherever there is more blue, you're going, you're going to bring up that blue. So there's those three, 3D LUTs. So you don't have to worry about it. You can, you can get it from uh, lots of places. But this is what 3D LUT does. Now, let me show you how this LUT is applied. Um, maybe. Through. Let's come here. So you start with an image like this. Looks flat. Looks doesn't have much contrast in it, but has all the information in it. And you apply a lot, and it it becomes like this. You can change the lot, and you can give it a different look. Um, for instance, uh, you can give it a look like this, a more crunchy look, more grungy look, or you can give it a vivid look. So this is all what a lot does to you. You start with a flat thing, you apply a lot to it, uh, and it becomes like uh, color. Now, here it didn't do a very good job because most of these LUTs are defined for a well uh, exposed image. So, if you don't have a well exposed image, you first brighten it and then you apply the LUT, and you'll see that, that, that things would be in a better, better zone. So, that's just an example of how, how LUTs work. Okay. Uh, enough of that. Now, we said that why did we go into all of this? Because ultimately, your, your display is linear. You start with something, your sensor is linear. Why did you have to introduce this, this log curve and all that sort of stuff in, in the middle? There is a very important reason for that, and that's because our eye is kind of logarithmic. Our eye does not look at difference in intensity, but it looks at ratio of intensity. So when you go in intensity by, say, five magnitudes, when you are sitting on an on a intensity of, say, 100, is very different. Perception is very different from when you go through this five units of, uh, of intensity increase while the background intensity is five or 10. Right? So in one case, you will see a much larger change in intensity when the, your background intensity was, say, 5 or 10, versus when the same 10 is put on a, on a pedestal of 100. So brighter the object, less contrast is our eye has. Darker the object, the more contrast our eye has. Okay? This is the important thing. Our contrast is dependent, depends upon the background level. So in, in shadows, in, in, in towards. Uh, the lower end of the spectrum, we have got much more contrast in our eye than when you go to, to, the, to, to, to a bright uh, picture. So you can still see the difference. Like you look at a cloud, you can still see the shades. But are those the true shades that, that you see? No. Our eye has already compressed it. But it's important to, to know that those shades are there. Our eye will pick up that detail. What is even, and this is kind of uh, shown here, that this is a gray patch, each width. Uh, twice the amount of light. So this is 18% gray. So it reflects 18% of the signal back. 
This reflects 36% of the signal, 72%, this is 9%, and so on. Spanning from 0, say 3.5% to 95%. This is what, what printers used to use. But the important thing here is that 18% gray kind of feels like in the middle. And that's what our eye does. That 18% of light or so, there are lots of uh, details on that. I don't want to go into that. It's about 18% of the light looks like the mid-tone to us. Now, if I have a linear sensor, I do not want to put that 18% on the linear scale because that's where I'm losing out on a lot of signal. I want to put a log curve so that I put most of my bits where most of my information is. Let me say it again. Let's say I've got a 100% range and here is my 20%, one fifth of the width. If I didn't put any curve, then the 20% will be coded with the same number of bits as the 80, 90% is. But if I put a log curve, I throw more bits at the 20% range, which is where my eye is more sensitive to, than at the 80%, 90% range. In fact, what I have done is that my 80%, 90% gets crushed, and that's a log curve, and that's what you would want in order to throw, uh, keep in all the highlights, while where my signal is, which is 18% gray. I mean, everybody uses 18% gray to, to balance their camera, remember? That's where I have turned up most of my contrast. Uh, you kind of see it, this red has this log 3G10, where this is the curve, the input light levels, linear light levels to the output. You see this log curve. Uh, this top is 184, and this is 0. This is the 18% point, or the 0.18, and that's mapped to, to uh, one third of the signal strength, and that's where the 3G comes in. And between this 18% and the 184, where it kind of hits one, there are 10 stops, right? So what I've done is that I have put my 18% gray point, which is where I'm going to see uh, by my skin tones and so on, map that to one third of the screen brightness and have held 10 stops above it. So if I've exposed myself properly, I've got 10 stops of highlight protection above that. And that's what gives you this film look. You could not have done this if you had started with a linear scale. In that case, you had to have started with, you have to have started with like 20 bit, 22 bit of uh, uh, digitization. That's just throwing away bits. Uh, you know, when you have a 16 bit ADC, that's already pushing your limits. Or a 15 bit ADC, you're already pushing your limits. Why do you want to do anything more? And that's what is done with the log. So that's why the log curve, <coughs> and everybody has different logs. Ari has a different log, Sony has a different log, Canon has a different log, uh, is trying to get the best, get the best skin tone and best highlight roll off. And we'll see some of the pictures. Um, let me not talk of, of this, but was this worth it? And this is what you see. This was Red's older uh, processing. And this is with the new, what is called the IPP2 which is a new uh, color scheme with this uh, 3G log 10. And you can immediately see the difference in skin tones while holding the background much, much better. All right, um, the same thing happens in shadow. I don't want to go over it. So let me talk about the highlight roll off for a second, because that's, that's another very important thing that you should look out for. Look at the picture. The picture on the, light, uh, on the, on the left has very poor highlight roll off. The one side of the face is completely uh, overexposed, which is okay. Sometimes that's what you would have. But how it comes into the, into the real exposure is a very sharp edge. There is no smoothing function that you see on the right-hand right side. So what's happened is that this camera or, or this, this display did not hold the brights, the highlights at all. And when it went to the dark, it became very flat. And there was a very sharp transition between the two. Sometimes you might want it. Sometimes there are, there are looks where you might want this kind of a grungy look. But even then, you would want to go or have the ability to go uh, right to dark in a very gradual way. That's what is called highlight roll off. And that's one of the things that you when you saw the film, you remember 
how beautifully everything was rolling off. There was nothing, no sharp, harsh edges. Uh, like for instance, here is a here is a picture. I mean, we talked about detail and sharpness. That here is a sharpened version of the same picture. And uh, if you look closely, this looks unnatural. This looks more natural. An edge, as we said, is never an edge. In fact, in, in films, and that's what kind of gives the film the natural look. If you looked at an edge, there is something called a halation. What would happen with a film when, you, when, it's when it's developed is that the film would, the grains would start off with a certain size. And as you develop, they kind of, kind of become bigger. They kind of bloat. And in the bloating, it also gives you these lovely roll-offs. So around the edges, and I don't know if you can see it here, maybe I zoomed in, you would see it, that on the right side, there is this kind of uh, roll off, and that's what we call halation. And today, in order to get even digital cameras to match the film look, we have to add this digitally. Um, and once you do that, and in fact, one of the things that's happening with, with films today is no longer just the sensor that matters. It's no longer how good your sensor is. Yes, you need to have a good sensor that gives you the 16 stops. But those how you display those 16 stops is where all the magic is. A lot of the magic is in the post. When you take them, you add, you roll them off very nicely. You add curves to that. You uh, emphasize some, de-emphasize others. You add back some of the grain so that everything is not flat. There's the, there's always have a feeling of texture, which you always had with the film. You add this halation where the edge is not a sharp edge. There, it's kind of slowly falling off. When you do all of these things, uh, you get really good pictures. Uh, in the red case, it started with very things. This is Phil Holland has done a whole bunch of study on it. And what we found is that this medium contrast and highlight roll off to uh, give you the best look. This was too harsh. The skins are very uh, flat here. This is the kind of thing that gives you the best thing. And now, now this is under your control. You control many of these things. It's no longer that you have to live with what you get in the camera. Of course, if you're shooting with an iPhone or if you're making a quick movie, you don't want to spend a whole lot of time in, in the back end. But if you're making a movie that is going to be in theaters, or even a movie that's going to go on a 4K TV, so let's say on Netflix, Netflix is 4K delivery, you want to make sure that you squeeze every, every ounce of texture, detail, roll off, softness out of it. And that's what you do digitally. So filmmaking has now become as much as how you light it, how you, you create your look, what kind of sensor you have, and as much as equally as what kind of backend processing you do. I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this because uh, I want to move to. Uh, here's a very quick thing that a smartphones don't have enough latitude. Uh, I will go into this, and now I want to go and show you a whole bunch of movies one by one and show you the comparison of different senses, what they can do and what they cannot do. OK, so um, I just hope everybody can see the, the, uh, the, the, the movies that I'm displaying. Um, before that, I want, to, I, I, I want to give you an example of the detail and sharpness. I remember I was talking about that, how sharpness and detail are sometimes confused. Let me give you an example of that. I think that it's, it's worthwhile seeing that example. Open with quick time. Okay. All right. Here is what I want. Where I want to go to. Okay. This particular image is taken with a um, Panasonic. You know, not Panasonic. This is a Fujifilm. Uh, it's a medium format sensor. It's bigger than than. than uh, full frame. All right, now you look at this picture and you see how beautifully it's showing all the textures in on the face. All right, nothing is overdone. All the textures are there. You can see every lines, and yet the fall off from one line to another is very gradual. 
Uh, yeah, there is a harsh edge, that's your lighting. Uh, but even when you're going from the dark to bright, there is no, it doesn't uh, jump out at you. Look at around the nose, it's beautifully falling off from the, from the bright edge to, to the darkness, All right? This is your detail. Uh, and this is when it has been sharpened, where you can tell now, okay, let me go to an example. Uh, comparison side by side and you, you can see but you see how beautifully softly it falls off and here how harsh they are what you've done is that you've taken the contrast the local contrast and you have enhanced it because you've enhanced the contrast the same details are there but everything is looking way sharper and that's the look you don't want this is the look you want you've got enough details you've got, you see all the imperfections in the scheme but skin but everything is falling off beautifully. Look at the nose. It's nicely falling off. Here, everything is over sharpened. You don't see it like this. This is what we're used to seeing. And that's the difference between detail and uh, sharpness. It's very, very, very important because very often uh, we would uh, go for this look. We say, oh, look how much detail we can see. But no, you don't want to see detail. You want to see texture. This is texture. This is detailed. I'm sorry, this texture, this is sharpness. Let me rephrase. You want to see detail, you don't want to see sharpness. This is textured, this is sharp. You want to see the details, but not in high contrast. Uh, I think I pretty much everything is, and this is, by the way, this is an over sharpening. Uh, this is an over sharpening, and this is where you see compression uh, artifacts, where uh, you can tell now that this is, this is way over sharpened. You see blockiness, uh, that, that's just this is artificial, and that's what happens when you over sharpen a, a, a picture. So, never confuse sharpness with detail. You, we want detail, we want texture, we don't want sharpness. Okay, I made my point. I think that's enough of point making. Um, I think now I think I want to go to a series of, of movies. Um, I know we have gone way past our time and I think I'm pretty much at the end. So let's see these movies and then we can, you guys can all go to sleep. Uh, so let's, uh, let's do that. Let us now turn the screen share on again. And let's first compare uh, Sony A7, a good camera to iPhone Pro. And this is sort of iPhone's bragging rights. Okay. Under same lighting conditions, here are a set of images taken with uh, Sony A7i and iPhone Pro. Uh, before that, I want to show you something. Here you can see immediately one of the differences of the size that smaller sensor, much more things in focus. Look at the shoe is in complete focus, shoe is not in focus. This is what you get with the bigger sensor. You see blur more of the background. But otherwise, the pictures look pretty good. Skin tones are good. I mean, I, I can't say that iPhone uh, 11 Pro is doing any worse than Sony A7i in this A A7 III. Uh, again, it's holding up the darks are, are nice and dark, no noise. Um, colors, probably I'd say Sony A7 III is better color, but hey, and this is beautiful. Um, highlights are falling off very nicely. Uh, outdoors, uh, they are they're good. So my point is that if you are have enough light, so you're shooting outdoor, and very you can use an ND filter to bring the light in in the right zone. Uh, even a small sensor like iPhone 11 Pro is very very good but let's see how it stacks up against red okay here an iphone and a scarlet now uh, scarlet is not the high end of the uh, uh, red line it's it's more of the aps-c size sensor uh aps-c remember compared to a, a full frame is about one third uh not one third uh four third of, of the size three-fourths of the size, rather. Uh, here are the pictures. 
Scarlet on the left, iPhone on the right. Uh, in these kinds of wide shots, it look good. Uh, and it's a matter of, of choice, whether you want to see everything in focus. I personally would like things a little bit out of focus. So I like the scarlet look here. But hey, I mean, if you are, if you gave me this picture, I would not complain. So yeah, if you're outdoors, enough light, things are good. Here is the first point that you see that's different. Here, I want to, I mean, obviously I've taken this kind of a shot because I want to focus on something on the screen that is on the screen in the hand of this person. The iPhone screen. But what happened with the iPhone Pro is that every damn thing is in focus while you've been able to blur it out in red because it's a larger format sensor. We went over that. Okay, let's keep going. Here is where you'll see a difference very, very clearly. Uh, let's go over it again. Uh, look at the colors. The colors are kind of, it's kind of screaming at you. It's kind of, kind of unnatural colors. Uh, everything is in focus. Things are not looking right, but not bad. I mean, if you gave me this picture, I will not necessarily complain, but I say eh, it's not looking too good, especially when you see what red would do. Look at this. Beautifully, things, colors are much brighter. Uh, lights are coming in much more beautifully. Uh, the background is blurred out. So everything is looking much more realistic. And that's what you get with the big sensor. Same here. When you're following this guy, everything was in, oh, that was too short. Everything was in, was in focus. With the red scarlet on the right, things are not in focus. Here, the skin tones are beautiful. Here, everything is crunched up. All the sky has, is gone. That's the, that's the limitation of your latitude. Look at the sky over here. You can see the sky. When you go to the iPhone, sky is gone. So this is what happens. You get a much more contrasty, built up look with iPhone, much more softer look. And here, look at it. This is a very tough time to shoot because you are in the back. There is a lot of light coming from the sun, from the setting sun. So yeah, but, but there is a softness in this picture. You look at the iPhone uh, picture after this, you see how harsh it has become and so much lens flare. Oh. Uh, so here is a, here's a difference. Look at the skin tone of iPhone Pro. It's kind of looking a little off here. There's beautiful roll off. Everything is much more in the real zone. That's a difference between what you get between iPhone uh, 11 Pro and a red scarlet. The real difference comes in, the difference comes in when you shoot at low light level. Uh, when you are in this kind of a you know wide shot, enough light. Everything looks like, except that the look at the blowout with the iPhone Pro. It, it didn't have the latitude to hold it up. The red holds it up very, very nicely. No ugly uh, thing. Your attention is drawn here. And while your attention, probably you want to draw it over here or to the entire scene. And that's the reason why uh, it's important to have the latitude. Without the latitude, this is an ugly thing that stands out in your eye immediately goes there on this bright spot over here. Instead of looking at the scene, which is probably what you wanted to show. With red scarlet, you, you manage to hold that through. Uh, again, when you're sh shooting in a lot of light, outdoor, and uh, a landscape, it's good. Uh, as soon as you go to low light levels, things begin to fall off, and you, you will see that even more. Like here, for instance, the setting sun. Uh, Scarlet is holding off very nicely. You go to the uh, go to the uh, where is it called? I want to show the dark. Oh, the dark one is in the other one. Okay, so I'll, let me show the other other one, which is where, where the darkness is shown. Again, the red on the right, creamy look. By the way, this is one picture where I thought that iPhone did a, did a great job. In fact, one of the things with iPhone. Uh, this 10, 11, all of these guys, is that there is a magic hour kind of. Uh, give, give a second. Sorry for that. I didn't control it. Uh, there's a kind of a magic hour just after sunset that iPhone gives really beautiful pictures. Uh, that's, that's something that they have done done with it. Uh, Red has all the information. Here, here is here is a picture where I wanted to show you the the dynamic range again. Look at the sky. Look at the sky. Okay, all the information is there. You can go and play with it. There's nothing you can do here. 
uh, that's where you want want a, a bigger sensor, uh, higher quality sensor. Um, point here is that there is not much information in this iPhone, right? So you cannot do much if you wanted to pop the, the sky, everything else goes dark. While with a, with a uh, red, you can play with it. You look at it. Uh, don't let you look at it. You see how beautifully I have been able to get get up to get the lights out, the sky out, and give a cinematic look to to my uh, subjects. It's where when you go to shoot at night, uh, red winds, of course, much bigger sensor, much bigger sensitivity. Talked about it. More the area, more light, and you, here you look at, and this is somewhere you can see the difference really, really clearly. This is iPhone. This is red, so much more nicer. Uh, not much here. Look how harsh it the face has become. How soft it is. Looks ugly. Looks nice. Not much more to say, but I mean, you expect this that the two areas where iPhone really falls off, falls falls apart, is when you go to dark areas. And when you go to high latitudes, where there's a sun and something else in the in, 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 in the in the frame, iPhone falls apart. If you shoot it in a moderate light, outdoors, landscape, iPhone is great. But it's about shooting everything else uh, as well, right? So this is what happens. iPhone is blown out, red is not. Now you expect that. <laughs> All right, how about then a Sony um, A6400, which is a pretty decent camera. Uh, uh, I think it's an APS-C mirrorless camera um, compared to Red uh, Scarlet. There are pictures. Which do you think is the Red and which do you, do you think is a Sony? I think you can tell. The one on the left is Sony, one on the right is Red. Skin tones, skin tones, the dead jewelry. Look at the skin tone difference. Uh, look at how everything falls off. Uh, okay. Look at the shadows. Look at the skin tone. Look at the unnatural color of the skin tone. This is where you would want a red. This is this is nothing has been done to it, by the way. Now, no, no uh, curves or anything has been added. This is straight off the camera. And see how the uh, the highlights are falling off. It's much more crunchy looking. Again, low light, red winds. All right. So, point is that the reason there is a reason why you spend so much money. Uh, with your uh, movie cameras, it takes a lot. You know, it's it's very much like uh, what I used to say that uh, when you take tests uh, in school, uh, getting to eighty percent wasn't that difficult. Getting to eighty to eighty-five, a little more difficult. Getting to ninety, more difficult. The ninety to ten was the more di most difficult part, and that's exactly what's happening. Most of the cameras today at the 70, 80% level are, are already there. It's your fighting for the last 20%. And you got to decide if those last 20% matter to you. If you're making a movie, which is ultimately going to be seen on a 16 screen on, uh, on a TV uh, with a 4K delivery, yes, it matters. If you're going to be seeing it on your laptop, on your, on your iPhone, um, you know, on a smartphone or on a tablet, it doesn't matter. Okay, here is a DSLR. I forget which one it is. Uh, what's the Alexa? It's a uh, which one is this? It's a Canon, I think. Uh, yes, a Canon Canon 80D. Uh, what's the Alexa? And you see the difference right away that the skin tones are so much nicer in in Alexa. Again, skin tones so much more nicer, so much more milky, creamy on 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 Alexa than than on the uh, Canon. And Canon, by the way, Canon 80D is a, is a great camera. But this is what you're getting extra when you go to a, a movie camera. Uh, the real case where I think it shows up is, is here. This is sort of the blue hour, which is after the sundown, uh, the cityscape. 
look at this beautiful kind of magical look in the background that you get with Alexa and this crunchy, yucky kind of thing that you see with the DSLR. And you put your subject uh, in, in, in against that background, and the subject pops up. While you do that with, with your DSLR, uh, where's the DSLR? Yeah. You, you don't want to see, see this. This is the difference that, that you see. It's again, this last 20%. Different lighting. Skin tone becomes, you know, goes bonkers, goes bananas in DSLR. In Alexa, it's, it's holding up beautifully. Let's go through this. The very different lighting. Again, the skin tone holds. You, even though the lighting has changed from blue to, to a warm. Look at the skin tone on the on the left. It's it's looking weird. I can go through this, but I think the the better thing you see is on this one. Now, this is a very tough thing for a camera to hold up. You have a lot of darkness, a lot of textures here, a lot of textures in the hair. And then you're throwing in fire, and you want to see some of the, the, the flickering tongues of fire. You don't want to see everything flat out. All right? And that's exactly what happens. You see the tongues of fire so much more well defined with, with, uh, with Ari, with Alexa, than with this Canon. And you see how much of the shadows it, it manages to hold on compared to uh, the DSLR. I hope you see that. Um, again, in, in darkness, so much more pleasing. Look, look, look the, 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 the subject has almost disappeared against the background. Here, the subject is popping up. Fire, look at the fire. Fire is flat, fire has texture. You see that the, the, the point I'm making is that when you look at a compare of movie camera compared to a DSLR, a good DSLR, uh, the latitudes, that you get that is seen both in shadows as well as in highlight is where all the differences as well as in the skin tone. Okay, I think uh, I think I'm pretty much done with this. Let and by the way, this is where it's 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 a log uh, curve before you've done on the grading. And you see that all the tiny details are preserved, and these are the details that you can. Uh, show up uh, in the in your post processing okay now let's go to the the big guys uh, what happened here? red monstro versus alexa lf both about the same size, sensor size, total sensor size. The number of pixels are different. Red Monstro has 8, 8K. It's 8K by 4K sensor, 32 megapixels. While the Alexa is a 4.5K by 3K, I think. It's a sensor. It's a 12, 14, 15 megapixels. So big megapixel difference. Um, both of them are scaled down to 8K so that we see it on a... On a I mean, here is what I will tell you. This is, we are seeing it scaled down to 8K. I mean, scaled down to 4K. Going through all the compression that uh, this particular video conferencing thing is, is giving you. So I don't know what you're going to be seeing, really. But this is something that you should look at on your, on your own screen. And you would be seeing the subtle differences between the two. And the difference is subtle. And uh, perhaps I won't talk, uh, talk much about it, but... What has been done is that this is done by Phil Holland again. He, he did a lot of this, this kind of comparison of skin tones, of how the highlight rolls off, how much latitude do you have, how do you see in the dark, how do you see in the shadows. Let me just play. Remember, they were not shot at, at the same time. They were shot 
two separate times. So there are always differences in in light that that comes in how the the the, the, the subject moved. <coughs> so you should back that out. By the way, here is one place where I thought the even though I think Alexa is one of the best skin tones in the world, this one has a better skin tone than Alexa. This skin tone to me, uh, how this light falls off is way better than, than, than Alexa. By the way, one more thing I should point out is that uh, even though one is an 8K sensor and the other is a 4.5K sensor, both scaled down to 4K, you're not really seeing difference in texture. You're not seeing difference in resolution. You're not seeing difference in details. So in a way, one might say 4K is an overkill. This is one place where I saw Alexa stood out because the colors are much nicer. The blues are much more green in it. That's what I think Alexa has done. It has added a little bit of green in the, in the blue. So this, this I'm, I mean, personally, this to me looks much more uh, natural, much more squished than, than, than uh, this blue, uh, blue of, the, of the red is. I mean, you know, after all, movies, one of the major thing in movies is making sure that you get desaturated colors. Uh, saturated colors is an anathema to, to movies. Um, don't tell Bollywood about that. But generally speaking, in movies, you don't want saturated colors. Uh, there's subtle differences. Let me not go into that. There are enough shades in both of them. Uh, though noise-wise, I felt that reds were doing a little bit better. Uh, this was a little too noisy for my test taste this on the right. Uh, this is, I don't know, who has this kind of clothing? Who wears these kinds of clothing? But here is something. Now, here is an interesting thing. I felt that... Uh, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the actual colors are, but the reds here are much more balanced out than the reds on on uh, Ari. So while I say the blue uh, blues were better in in Ari, but the red seems to be better on red. But that's, maybe that's why they call them some red cinema. Joking. That's not why they call it. Actually, I don't know why they call it. Not much to to see here. Yellows. I thought the yellows were much more vibrant in, in, in red than, than in Alexa. Alexa seemed a little too dull to me. And now these are all, now we're getting into matters of taste. Now, is this ye the yellow on the left more accurate than the yellow on the right? Or yellow on the right is more accurate than yellow on the left? I don't know. But just to me, uh, looking at it, uh, at this point, without, I mean, if somebody else graded the film, they might do it differently. But this feels like uh, the uh, red thing were a little bit better. Here I thought was one place again, surprisingly, very surprisingly, red monstro skin tones of all the different uh, models were uh, much nicer, much smoother. Let me play that again. And you have to look at it again and again. I think her face, for instance, the face on the bottom right, left, uh, is much flatter than on the top left. Uh, while it's not not sharp, it's not not you know harsh. Uh, same with the second uh, girl from from the left. Uh, the red seems to be popping out more. Uh, even the darker skin seems to have a much nicer feel to it. Uh, than 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 Alexa. Now it's you know it's again if you grade it differently, you'll probably get it de different things. Uh, it depends upon the look that you're going for. But just off the bat, to me, the look on the top, which is the reds look, was nicer. Uh, 
Uh, these are tests of uh, various patches with ISO 200, 400, 800, 1600. Uh, daylight source, not much to write home about. Tungsten source, I want to show you something. That's, that caught my eye. And you look at the color patch on the left, the browns, and the color patch on the right, which is the Alexa. To me, the Alexa colors are more realistic than, 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 than reds in tung under tungsten. So this is an interesting thing that under tungsten, just on the color patches, uh, Harry looks a bit uh, somewhat better. So let's keep going, 3200. So the other point is this, that, that at, at ISO 800, 1600, there is not a whole lot of difference. I mean, this is a co comparison between ISO 1600 of both of them. In this case, the light has not been changed. The light is the same. You're just in the post changing the ISO making it brighter. Does it add noise? Well, at 1600 ISO, the ARRI is beginning to show some noise in the bar just above the black. Uh, the red is much clearer to me. And when you go to, uh, I mean, here, the noise is very, very clear. When you go to 3200, the Alexa noise is way clearer, way more visible than uh, red. So in other words, Red is holding on to the darks much nicer uh, than, than, than Alexa is. I mean, you can see it. You can see the noise very clearly. Uh, dynamic range. Now, this is, again, you remember the Xyla chart. This is 0 to 20. These are 21 stops that are here. So each bar is twice as reflective as the other. Okay. Uh, how far can you see? Um, well, um, I don't know where you can count, but you certainly can see up to 16 stops here uh, in both, both of them. So I'd say that both of them have about uh, 16 plus stops that you can very, very clearly see. Again, um, not a whole lot of difference between the two. When you go to Rec. 709, Rec. 709 is one of the color spaces where you finally finish. You shoot in log, you have some intermediate colors where you can see all the colors, all the shades, but then you have to deliver it to a, a custom format. And all those custom form formats have not enough range as your intermediates have. And what I can kind of see is that now, you know, this is now splitting hair, but the uh, ARRI kind of holds the mid-tones nicer and then suddenly falls off. Red's fall off is much more gradual and the red in the, the sixth bar is brighter and maybe that's where ARRI wins, but over here, red wins where it's, it's, in, it's more in the dark. So basic thing that I, I have seen is that Ari seems to hold the highlights better. Red seems to hold the darks uh, better. So reds give you much more uh, this uh, uh, this you know contrasty look that you might want for a thriller or something like that. Uh, Ari gives you much more of the screeny look that you would want for a drama or a romantic uh, uh, drama kind of a thing. So. That's what we're back to the beginning. Um, let's see what else do I have. There is one more thing I wanted to show you. And that's the last thing. I don't know if you can actually see this. I really doubt, but let me try. This is a work that was done by.
please stay he is coming <clears throat> please stay there is some problem he is coming right now Okay. okay okay i'm back Good. i think yeah. i don't know yeah. where i dropped off you wanted to see uh, show us something oh the resolution the resolution yeah. thing is where i think i dropped up okay yeah. so you saw the red versus ari comparison thing right yes yes right okay all right so this is the last thing i want to show you mm. here you go okay so here is a picture again done by yedlin uh, where he compared uh, 6k versus a 2.3k footage all finished at 4k and uh, he invited us to see do you see a difference Okay, 6K, 2K. A different uh, down raising algorithms. 6K, 2K. Here is an interesting thing. In fact, if you look at it, uh, okay, 6K, 2K. Now, this 2K looks sharper. And this is, a, in my view, it actually brought in some stuff that was not there. This is where sharpness and detail gets confused. Okay, This is why this 3K, which brought up artifacts, which now looks as if there is more information, but there isn't. It's false information. It falls off beautifully over here in the 6K. In the 2K, this has been accentuated. So in a strange way, Depending upon how you downsample from a 6K footage to a 4K footage or upsample from a 3K footage to a 4K footage, the 3K footage might look to have more details, although that's just sharpness. The point is, as you look through this, there is not a whole lot that's happening at the 4K level even. At the 4K, you are pretty close to the edge of your perception. So yeah, 8K is something that on a, on a big movie theater, IMAX theater, you, you would be able to see something. But as far as resolution goes, it's a function of so many different things, of the texture, of how it falls off, of the sharpness, of color, how the color rolls off, that if when you fold all of these things together, for me, it looks like 4K is a pretty good place to be. It would be really uh, going into uh, smaller and smaller. Um, oh, I've lost my slides as well. No, I haven't lost. Uh, uh, oh, what happened here? One second. I want to go to the last slide, which is where we are right now. And somehow, when I logged out, it got me to the. Uh, just turn off your screen share. Oh, the screen share, of course. Yes. <laughs> Too many controls. By the way, this is actually one of the things which <coughs> Red users versus Ari users complain about. Red needs lots of controls. Ari has few buttons that you press. All right, here is the last uh, slide. So as I said, I think 4K is, a, is about the end of the road. 2K is pretty good. But remember that in a car race, it's not the car, but the driver that gets a reward. So right now where we are at a point, a large amount, number of cameras are pretty equivalent going from DSLRs and mirrorless to the movie cameras. Admittedly, all the movie cameras certainly uh, Red and Harry, uh, when you go to their, 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 their high-end ones, has way more horsepower, way more stuff, way more 
beauty than a mirrorless has. But for most applications, mirrorless is, is good. If you are doing, though, uh, uh, 4K footage, um, nice movie you're shooting, a nice web series you're shooting, uh, you want to you want to make it stand out uh, in international standards. Yeah, you would still want to use one of the movie cameras. Choose the camera that you use. Remember, that's not what's going to make the difference. It's you, your composition, your lighting, and your thought, your vision that's going to make the final difference. So I think that's pretty much where I want to end. We've taken. Um, uh, way more than what I, uh, you know, <laughs> than I expected it to go, uh, but that always happens. And uh, now let's see what do we do now. Hello. Now we have to answer some uh, some questions oh because already it's a thirty minute. Just two three questions we shall take. Uh, don't worry about. I, mean, I can take questions, but uh, okay. All right. Um. Yeah, very, very simple questions. If there is any, can we get or record? Okay, so many, uh, no, so many people are asking that can we get some recorded version of this? Because you see, it will be available in the Fipreski India's YouTube channel. Fipreski India has got a YouTube channel, so it will be available there. Later on, you can watch it there. And uh, some now, if anybody asks any question, we can, we, we'll, we are not going to the previous questions, it is not possible. My email is pretty simple. Uh, shall I type it here? Maybe I can send it to everybody here. Uh, even, uh, yes, you can type it here. That will be better. I can type it. It's bedabrata.pine at It's bedabrata.pine at gmail.com. Um, you know, honestly, the material that I have here, I needed to go at a much slower pace. Probably this is material for, uh, you know, uh, four or five hour lecture, maybe longer. If you go slowly over each of them, which is, of course, wasn't possible. Uh, but um, but I think you got, got the idea. I mean, I think if one of the things uh, if I've left you with is that, you know, appreciate the film look. Uh, most of us don't. Most of us, you know, are so used to watching crappy images, uh, especially when it comes to sharpness. I see a lot of the time people just sharpen an image and say, "Ah, this, this is where. Look, look how much resolution there is." No, it's not resolution. It's crappiness. Um, so that I think the most important part of making a good image is to make it creamy, make the the going from bright to to dark in a nice, gentle way, not in a harsh way. And a lot of that, of course, depends upon uh, your um, uh, how you light it. Uh, there is no substitute to it. There is, of course, a, as I said, today's cameras have become so, so, so much better that you can um, you know, increase the uh, ISO, uh, pull it up or, or push it up in, 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 in post quite a bit. Two stops for sure, and more than that, I would hesitate. And again, of course, it depends. I mean, you know, you've got to shoot. You've got a you've got a problem sequence which is important for your storytelling. It will is going to come for two seconds. Sure, go for it, but don't shoot your entire movie on that. Uh, you have got a static shot on 8K, and you want to establish it, and you want to give it a little bit of a movement, and you want to use digital pan and zoom. Sure, but don't think that that's a substitute for establishing your shot using some motion. Um, <clears throat> Now, there is one question. Oh, my God. I mean, I, I don't know how to email. You, I'm not able to serve. You, you go to this one. One, I'm just highlighting it. Uh, you see, uh, Shamgata Banerjee, if 4K is the end, of, end of the road, or where do we go beyond this? Yes. You know, <sighs> short answer, I don't know. Every time I argue from physics, I lose. Uh, there was there was a time. Oh, by the way, did people not get my ID uh, email ID? Or uh, okay, let me type it again once more. I'm typing. You just tell me. Uh, Bedabrato dot train at gmail dot com. Go. All right. Um, so eight four K. So you know, look, people are already talking about eight K TV. 
Um, so I cannot say that that that's the end of the road. Like if you look at pixel resolution, uh, what our eye can see, uh, we are talking about probably something like 600 megapixel. But then, and this is this is where the problem comes in. That our eye does some very 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 funny things. Um, you know, our eye has a 150, 150 plus minus, uh, yeah, total 150 degrees field of view. No, what am I saying? Yeah, uh, 150 degrees field, 150, 160 degrees field of view. But most of your resolution is, is, in, is in the middle. That's where you see most of your stuff with. The resolution very quickly falls off at, uh, towards the edges. Is that the way we should be shooting? Is that the way we should be displaying? I think, I think a bigger thing that would happen is in the display technology. Not just scaling up pixels, but maybe maybe seeing it, showing it differently. Uh, a major part where I think changes are going to happen is in the uh, scaling algorithm. So what I, what do I mean by that? I think I went over that very very quickly. You have your 8K data. Now you're going to feed it into 4K. So you are somehow reducing your information from that 8K to 4K. So it's like actually a factor of four loss because 8K versus 4K goes into 4K by 2K, right? How are you doing that? Surely you're not subsampling because then, then you might as well have shot it on, on 4K. So you're going to use those four pixel data and, and, and go into one pixel. Uh, and you do some kind of processing there to still give you uh, the uh, impression of, of uh, texture. Uh, which you captured in 4K, but would kind of be lost, but you'll still be seeing it. And that part we haven't um, mastered very well. I think that, that that's one area where there's going to be a lot of improvement. Furthermore, there are areas of the of the image where it's very flat. I mean, look look behind me. You know, the, the, the wall is flat. There's no reason for us to throw away that information. In fact, we can use that information to improve the signal noise ratio. Right? So, so this element of where you keep you bin pixels together to improve your signal to noise ratio where you use those that resolution to bring in an extra texture without adding sharpness is where the scaling algorithms are and scaling algorithms i think is one of the most overlooked areas of uh, uh, of color grading and image processing today i hope that answers the question okay Thank you. Another is Mr. Ram. Can you explain how to different native ISO can have the same noise level, but in between has higher noise level? I don't quite understand the question. Um, yeah, I just check it. Can you explain how two different native ISOs? I mean, if you're referring to the example I gave you between between. Uh, Canon A7S and A7R. I think that's what you're, you're referring to. I think uh, and this is this is where face-to-face -face interaction becomes so much nicer. But but if that's what you're referring to, the issue is very simple: that the one per pixel gathers more light by throwing away resolution. And when you have more resolution at the same ISO, you would see much lower noise. Or for the same brightness, you get much lower noise because one is generated from an from an image that has way more electrons. And let me give you an example. Let's say I have the same light falling on two sensors. One of them has a three micron pixel, and one of them has a five micron pixel. What would happen? Well, the one with the three micron pixel, everything else is the same. We'll capture, say, three squared, nine units of light, whatever the unit might be. And the one with the five uh, micron pixel will have 25 um, units of light. So nine versus 25, almost a factor of three. So the the one that had that has a bigger pixel either will be way more brighter, but if you match the brightness, then has lower noise. Why? So nine units, let's say it corresponds to say 900 photons. Okay, and let's say one photon to one electron so nine 900 electrons in in that in that pixel in that sensor and in the other one you get 2500 five square 2500 so 900 electrons has a signal to noise ratio of 900 square root that's 30 30 to 1. the other one is 25 square root 50 50 to 1. 
right? 30 to 1 versus 50 to 1. And this point doesn't seem that bad. But suppose instead of 900, there were nine electrons in one and 25 in the other. And the read noise of both of them, let's say, is two electrons. Now you do the com com computation and you see how the pixel that had 25 electrons will have much better signal to noise ratio and much better appreciation of, of the signal than the other one. And that's why when I say that whenever you go to a smaller pixel, you lose out in terms of noise. So if I am given, so that's why between A7S and A7R, by the way, cameras today, it's not just the pixels or even the sensitivity that matters. What matters is, not what matters, a large part of the things is how you display it, what are the features that you have, what kind of autofocus you do, what kind of log curve you're using, whole bunch of other things. Uh, so choice of a camera is, is, is a very personal choice, ease of handling, all of that kind of stuff. But the fundamental physics is this, that whenever you take the same format sensor, same size, lower the number of pixels, the more sensitive and more latitude it would have. All right, is it practical to shoot log with an eight bit camera? Uh, yeah, you should shoot, uh, uh, even, even on an eight bit camera, you should shoot, shoot, shoot log. It is, it is very, very practical. Um, in fact, they give you the, the, the flat profile, I, if I remember correctly, or on, on 7.3 uh, as well. Okay. Please explain, ah, chroma subsam, oh boy. Uh, color grading in terms of 420 to 422. I did not cover that. I did not uh, uh, get in that. Maybe we can take, take that separately because that will, I have to start from scratch to talk about what chroma subsampling is and, and 420, 422, 444. Uh, that opening up. New stuff. I don't want to do that at this point. That would be that would take a too long a time. Maybe we can talk talk about that uh, independently. You have my email. Why don't we get global shutter in Porta do Red Co? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Global shutter. Um, as I said, you know, Sony did introduce their S sixty five. I think it was a global shutter or S fifty five. I can't forget. I, I, I forget. And then they went back from it because. You know, intellectually speaking, yeah, I can see that global shutter would be better because you are freezing motion. Everything is happening at the same time. Things should be should be okay. Things should be good. Uh, but two things happen. One is that you remember even a display is happening on a raster scan basis. It's not happening simultaneously, uh, and our eye is very used to seeing this delay because even on a film, when when you have the shutter going, some some of the pixels will expose sooner than later, because there was a, literally a, a shutter with an opening uh, blade that was going in front of the lens, uh, in front of the, of the film. So we're very used to seeing this rolling shutter. And as a result, uh, the second, which is the second part, anything that's a problem is usually turned into a feature. Um, and then that, that's what has happened. How uh, the motion blur takes that rolling shutter into picture and how the rolling shutter takes, uh, how the global shutter takes rolling how the rolling shutter takes globe, uh, the, this, this uh, motion blur into picture and how global shutter takes motion blur into picture is very different. And I think we are more tuned to seeing the, uh, the, the rolling shutter uh, kind of behavior. And that's why I said one of the major things that you do whenever, whenever you're shooting a uh, movie, I mean, I'm not talking about real cinematographers, filmmakers, I mean, you know, uh, quick films they are shooting on your iPhone. One of the things you must do is choose your, FPS, don't let the camera decide it. And that's why you get, get an app like Filmic Pro or something, which lets you choose it yourself. You choose 24 FPS <coughs> and you choose 180 degree shutters, which means half the time the, 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 uh, the, the sensor is operative or, or, the, or it's sensing light, which means that you set, set your shutter speed to 48 FPS. That gives you the motion blur that we are very used to see. Not to say in a real movie, you do not use 90 degree shutter. Often you use 90 degree shutter for a very important reason. And that reason is that if you have motion and you want to give this jarring, uh, you know, that, 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 that uh, quick blast, you want to make the motion more, more jittery, more, more juddery. 
And that's where you go from 180 degree shutter, cut it down to 90 degrees shutter, and things would look more, uh, more, more shaky, more, uh, more punchy. On the other hand, uh, and this is something that that you know, you know, when you're shooting in low light, uh, motion will not matter so much. You can actually go to 360 degree shutter, so 24 fps uh, 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 frame rate, 24 fps shutter speed. Uh, you get double the light, which is very important in, in in low light level. Okay, according to DxO Mark, uh, for a lot of uh, dynamic range is changes. Ah, very good question. Excellent question. Ah, uh, let's see if I can explain that very very quickly. I think I had a slide. Okay, but I should have actually shown that. Uh, so what happens is that. In all of these cases, you're keeping your light level the same, and afterwards, you are changing your ISO levels, which is essentially adding a digital gain. Now, you don't want to gain up everything. Remember this lock curve, you kind of gain up at the shadows and still keep the highlight roll off. But as you're moving up and up in the scale, the amount of uh, uh, latitude you have above it it's not slowly reducing. Let me perhaps go to that. Uh, can I go to that uh, slide? Oh boy, where is that slide? If I had it, I would uh, be able to show it. Where is that red log Z curve? Yeah, so look at this curve. So this curve is set for a, a certain ISO. When you increase ISO without changing anything, you're not changing your light level, you're just changing your ISO. This point will move to the right or the left. Now, if you are increasing your ISO, this point will move to the right, which means you have less room left on the top. And that's why as you push the ISO, your, your room above your, uh, your uh, uh, your midpoint begins to reduce, and the number of stops underneath begins to increase. Except now you've got your noise to contend with. As you bring up your ISO, you're increasing the gain, so you're increasing the noise. So as you go after four or five stops, the noise begins to pick up. Now what's happening is that you're losing light at the top or losing room at the top because you're squeezing that room. But at the bottom, you cannot add anything more without bringing up noise. So as a result, as you increase your ISO, your total exposure value that you can go to slowly begins to change, begins to become smaller and smaller because you're losing headroom at the top, which you could have made up by, by headroom at the bottom, but except that noise comes in the picture and cuts that. So for all sensors, as you increase your ISO, you will generally get a, a lower uh number of stops that you or lower number of exposure values that you you have i hope that ex that explains it but i mean you know question is how you distribute these uh number of stops above and below and in fact red and and ari does it slightly differently and then i had a slide and let me see if i can bring up that slide uh, i didn't talk about olpf that's another important thing that i missed but uh, so here is an Ari. Generally speaking, if you stop it down three stops, uh, Ari can't go below that. But Ari holds highlights one stop above red. So which means that I have exposed it, then I just push it. I just increase the ISO and see where my picture begins to fall off. Red, because it has lower noise, it's better in shadows, it holds off almost two stops better in, 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 in darkness while the array holds up maybe one or maybe actually two stops over in, uh, in, 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 in highlight. So personally, I think right now, if you compare Monstro and, and Alexa uh, uh, LF, they both have about the same latitude, except that the Alexa is a little bit better in the highlights and the red is a little bit better in the in low lights. So that's the best way I can, I can explain. Uh, all right, again, um, who, 
how does dual iso work lovely question <laughs> uh dual iso you have to design the sensor that way so remember i said that in the sensor you have got your light coming in uh, it goes into the sensor the sensor converts those photons into electrons and then from those electrons inside each pixel you convert it into a voltage that's active pixel sensor that's what you do now that conversion the way you convert that electron into a voltage is a capacitor that capacitor will give you certain microvolts per electron right now typically in all of this let's say your iphone or even red the that conversion factor of how many electrons map to how many volts which is the capacitance is about 100 microvolts per electron that take give or take factor of two so it's about 100 microvolts per electron but suppose i designed a sensor where i have another switch by which i can make that 20 microvolts per electron 25 microvolts per electron now i've got a dual iso sensor so when you put the same amount of light when you you look at it with the 25 microvolts per electron you would see much more in the bright light because all the darks would be crushed <coughs> no noise but you'll see much more in, in in the in the in the bright and hence it is a lower iso sensor while the other one will see much more in in the dark in the dark because that that conversion gain actually makes the noise lower Larger the conversion gain, lower the noise, generally speaking. <clears throat> and you would see much better in light, but not as much in, 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 in bright, uh, in brightness or in, in highlights. So the higher sensitivity version, which is all you're switching with a switch inside the pixel. It's all inside the pixel. It's not even in the sensor. It's inside the pixel. Uh, going from that 25 microvolts per electron to 100 microvolts per electron will give you two stops of uh, two stop difference in ISO. If you make it uh, instead of 25, if you made it, uh, oh, I don't know, 12.5, uh, you get three stops. Uh, so that's okay. That, that, that's the way. Uh, I think Canon now has one, Red has one, Red Gemini. That's what, that's what, that's what, that's what they do. They, that, that's, that's the essential idea. The, the idea is to kind of have, you know, in olden days, you, you used to have, uh, by the way, this entire ISO thing comes from film again. Uh, the ISO uh, thing comes from the fact that uh, how much time it took to expose uh, a, a particular film. Um, is the image best captured on native ISO just a myth? Uh, well, this, this, there's a lot of, okay, depends upon your light. Now, the the native ISO, when you go to uh, bright sunlight, is very different from the native ISO when you when you when you're in, indoors. So, <clears throat> generally speaking, whatever they tell you is is your is, is the ISO rated for. <clears throat> the best way to think about it is that in most cameras, you have at least plus minus one stop above and below that you can go without without screwing up anything. Probably plus minus two stops. <clears throat> um, the best way, the best, best, best way is for you to take a camera and check it out. Shoot the camera at whatever it's rated to, whatever it's, uh, by the way, native ISO also means different things to different people, but let's say the rated ISO. You take the rated ISO and you uh, expose it by, you know, just, just turn down the light by one stop, two stops, three stops, and then uh, scale it back up and see where the, the image falls off. It's, it's a very simple test to do um i would recommend it for doing it for for any sensor that you try to evaluate so this is the last question uh, you can answer it then we can stop it because three hours we get you are well, talking you about interesting questions i mean there are there are lots of exciting exciting but, stuff uh but, oh the, there's one question about measured iso being different from manufactured iso it's a look you have to realize that, as I said, in film, ISO really meant something because it that's as long a grain took time to expose. So ISO was something physical. Here, ISO is a, is a matter of gain. 
it's a matter of digital gain that you apply or maybe an analog gain that you apply. And, and actually, that's, a, that's one point I want to clarify. That's, that's, that's very, very important. One of the reasons I like red is that, and you may have heard this, for ice for red, ISO is a metadata. Okay. What I'm what is meant by that is that the imager captures what it captures. The light sensitivity is not changing. Do you remember I told you very clearly that ISO is not light sensitivity, unlike a film. Here, the sensor has been designed, the pixel has been designed, it's going to capture whatever light it comes, whatever light it, it responds to, and however many volts it, it creates. After that comes your ISO, which is a gain. Now, where do you put the gain? Do you put the gain in the analog domain before you digitize it, which is what most camera guys do, which means you cannot really back out? Or if your sensor is low enough noise, which red says, you carry the information all the way through and you apply digitally a number and a digitally a curve, right? So anything that you're applying in, in, in red is done after the fact, and therefore you can back it out much, much more easier. When you set the ISO of say ARRI to, to 1600, you physically, the data that, that you get out of the sensor is already that data baked in. The gain has been set in internally inside the camera, in, inside the sensor. Uh, so there is no, so all the noise has already been built in. So here the advantage is that you shoot at 800 ISO, you want to, uh, you want to uh, push it to 1600 ISO, you do it and you don't like it, you go back to 800. Uh, you could, cannot do that for, for most other sensors. Uh, so so, so the, but, but to, go, to go back to it, the real ISO measurement would be you take a light meter and you see, you, you take the light meter and, and you, 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 you measure the amount of light falling on it. <coughs> and do you see either it matches on the sensor? Now, here is the question. What is matching on the sensor mean? Now, as you saw, red log 3G10 puts the 18% gray at 33%. That's not what Ari does. Ari does it at about 40%. Now, is that an ISO difference? You see, this is where all the difference in ISO terms come in. Uh, that because ISO has become such a free floating term, it depends upon the gain that you are putting in. Different people measuring different things will get slightly different stuff, different by almost half a stop. Red, I think a few years ago, uh, redid all their calculations. And for the new sensors, the DSMC2, uh, now the red's ISO that you you measure with a light meter uh, is pretty close, uh, but there is al always going to be this difference because of how you measure it, how where you measured it, what is your interpretation of the ISO. As I said, for instance, if you if you are, I'm telling you that I am setting my 18% gray bar to 33%, and somebody saying that no, my 18% gray bar is 40%, right there you've got a half a stop difference or third of a stop difference. Right, that that's that that that's the reason. ISO is a, a little bit of a, a hokey term. In in a same sensor, eight hundred ISO to sixteen hundred ISO is two two times the amount of light or two times brightness, not amount of light. I'm sorry, that's wrong. Two times brightness. But if you compare eight hundred ISO of red to eight hundred ISO of Canon, they may not be the same. Uh, there was a question asked. I, I the, who you what you said was the last question that uh, binning pixel binning. Well, that's a I mean pixel binning. First, first of all, is is available now on most cameras in red. It's definitely available because you have so so much resolution in ARRI. It doesn't make sense. But uh, yes, pixel binning I've used uh, times to to give you um, pixel binning can be done both ways. Pixel it can bin pixels, which is averaging, or you can add pixels where if you're in low light level, you can actually add pixels. So now you can trade off your resolution for the, for the signal. So, so, so you saw what I meant. This is an 8K. I have added, say, four pixels together. Now, the four, you can't just add four pixels, remember, because you've got this bare pattern filter, red, green, uh, green, blue. Uh, that's a pattern, right? Red, green, green, blue. So you cannot just add these four pixels because that, that's losing your, your, your uh, light information. You have to add red to a uh, red that's in the next quad, uh, and so on. 
and then there is a particular algorithm how you add them. But when you add them at low light level, you would be getting more signal. So ideally what you want to do, and that, that's where the backend processing hasn't developed fully, is that you want to add those pixels at low light level where your resolution is lower and where you want to boost up the signal. At the mid level, you, you want to keep your native resolution and find a way to, to take out every single detail. And at, at high light level, you want to bin them together and maybe even bin all the colors because our color perception in, in bright light is very, very poor. Right? So, uh, and maybe you want to bin them. So, you want to add, do nothing, bin. When will such things be available? I don't know. Is anybody working on it? Some people are. I don't know. Are people thinking about it? Not many. Ah, shit. I mean, there too many questions. I don't know how many others. Uh, how do some cameras get better recording capabilities? Oh, boy, this, uh, many of those questions <laughs> will, oh, yeah. I'm sure. oh, yeah. will be here till. Uh, okay. You must be tired. No, I'm not. I'm, wake, I'm just waking up. <laughs> I have my adrenaline going, so I'm fine. It's Indian that should be uh, asleep. Uh, I thought I did on native dual native ISO. I thought I talked about that, didn't I? Yeah. Was it earlier uh, question? I, uh, uh, few lines about my upcoming film. No, this is not not the uh, the place for to do that. What exactly would you use? Uh, why exactly would you use anything other than a small aperture, high f stuff? Uh, wait, wait, wait. Is this this? Oh, uh, uh, Bismita Bora's question: What exact? Why exactly would you use anything other than a small aperture or high f stop? Uh, would you pref prefer a bigger depth of field than just crop? Uh, no. In fact, I mean, I think that's what I was talking about. Depth of field is in the vertical direction, not in this direction. You know, in a picture like in this particular sensor, because it's a pretty small camera that's taking my picture. Everything pretty much is in focus. There's a picture in the back, the light shade, the, the blinds, me, everything is in focus. Even, even this, this is in focus. Okay, You don't want that. I mean, no, let me put it the other way. Many times you don't want that. Many times what you want to do is to just show me and everything else blurred out. When you use F22, two problems happen. First of all, you're letting in very low light, right? Of course, if you're in bright outdoors, that's all, what you might have to do unless you use an ND filter. But the idea of using ND filter to control light is that now you have control over your aperture with which you can control your depth of field. Admittedly, aperture is not the only thing that controls depth of field. But certainly, it is one of the major things once you've locked your, because you're not going to be switching your lenses. Not often you use a zoom lens. Very often, you want to use one uh, focal length lens, because that's a good lens built for that, that focal length. You don't often have choice of uh, how far from the object uh, subject you, you can be. I mean, especially if you're shooting some wildlife. You cannot go very close to the, the subject. Uh, even, even many, many actors become wild if you go too close to them. So you cannot go too, 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 too close to them. So, so you have all those constraints. So F number becomes one of the major ways you can choose your depth of field, where you put in. You want, I mean, ideally here, for instance, uh, after I've established myself, I might want to just keep me in focus and everything else blurred out. You cannot do that with F22 objects. For that, you have to go to F1.4, depending upon the camera, of course. Even 1.4 might not do it. Uh, like for the for the for the uh, for the small cameras, their depth of field is so wide that even at 1.8, <coughs> you get a depth of field that may be 100 meters long. Okay, so so no no, I mean you you definitely want to open up your lens. That's where you bring in beauty. Um, oh, compression. That's another whole different ball game. Uh, uh, Okay, there's, there's one uh, red raw different compression. Yeah, one of the great things red has done, one of the, you know, apart from, from making the great sensor and all that, was their compression algorithm. Um, this is a, this is a, uh, 
wavelet comp based compression which uh, what is a compression i mean a compression is, is is i mean i can simply show you this look at my my shirt you know it's black pretty much it's black everywhere right why do you want to send 10 bits for every single pixel of my uh, of my uh, t-shirt if you just took a difference you might see that most of the difference is within two to three bits, okay? Eight levels, maybe, I'm guessing. If that's the case, then I can send one 10-bit information and those multiple three bits information. It has exactly the same information content, but I have cut down the amount of data that I, that I send. Now, this is the essence of compression. The essence of compression is seeing places where the difference is small, contrast is small, and I want to send only the contrast data and an average data. So that average data you know, uh, covers that entire region, and in the region where the contrast is small, I can get, get by with one very high resolution data, 16-bit data, and a whole lot of two, three, four bits data. Okay. Very essential, this is the idea of compression. Now, how you do this, how you achieve this, how you find out which areas are of equal contrast and so on and so forth is where different compression algorithms differ. <coughs> Red's algorithm, <coughs> which is the <coughs> sorry, which is uh, wavelet based, is very good at doing that. So even when you cut down, uh, go to seven to one compression ratio, which is a very acceptable number for for eight k, uh, you don't lose out a whole lot. I mean, if you compare the loss of information between one is to one versus, say, certainly five to one, not a whole lot. Seven to one is perfectly acceptable. Even 12 to one for most cases where you would be finally finishing in 2K. Don't worry about it. Maybe even in 4K. So, yeah, I mean, how you shoot it matters. But <clears throat> generally speaking, uh, there is a lot more redundant information in a particular scene. And if your compression algorithm is good enough, you can take those information out, the redundant information out, and reduce the amount of data that you're sending out. By the way, our eye does that beautifully, and I also gets fooled by, as a result. Our eye probably has, if you look at counted all the rods and cones in our eye uh, over this 150 degrees field of view, 150, 160 degrees field of view, it's about. Uh, I forget, it's uh, 200 million or so. Uh, now I, I forget the number. It's in that range. <clears throat> Total 200 million rods and cones in our entire eye. The fovea, the macula, which is the portion where most of the resolution is, and the fovea, which is even smaller part of that, which is where all our color vision is, is only about six to seven million. The rest is giving you all this field of view. Our eye then sends the, all the information through this optical nerve that goes to our brain. This optical nerve is right next to the fovea, and there's a small opening, about a millimeter or a couple of millimeter square uh, area, through which this optical nerve goes in, bundle goes in. If you compare the amount of data that optical nerve can carry, it's nowhere near 200 million. It's nowhere even near that six to seven million, which is our high resolution data. It's, it's not nowhere near, it's close, close to that. In other words, our eye also does that and then fuses the data later on in our brain. Imaging happens in the brain, it doesn't happen in the eye. Uh, so yeah, so bottom line is that, so it is raw, <laughs> raw is raw, uh, but uh, it is A, the seven to one doesn't degrade your image much, Unlike many other uh, many other uh, algorithm like H two six four is a, is a, I think is a pretty bad compression algorithm throws out a lot it's a very lossy uh, algorithm. Um, in other words, what I'm saying is that if you take the one to one data, pass it through a seven to one, and then go back to one to one, you know, then do a do an inverse, you won't find that much information loss. While in H two six four, that's no, no longer not not the case at all. Um, uh, so yeah, so so raw is raw. So 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 even at seven to one, it's it's pretty much preserving everything. All you have done on that raw is that you have added these uh, these three G log ten 
which of course you can back out. That, that's the way you're packing the data so that, the, I mean, uh, let me re-emphasize, 18% gray, which is where all our skin tones and all are, and one stop over, one stop under. If you can get that accurately, if you can get that with high resolution, high resolution, not in spatial resolution, but uh, number of digital bits resolution, right, you've done your job. And that's where these log uh, things make so much more sense. The bigger question for me is that, will we get a nonlinear sensor like uh, uh, film? It's an interesting question. Uh, what else do we want to talk about? I don't know. Can I tell something about color grading? Yeah. In in India, we spell it with C-O-L-O-U-R. In America, we spell it with C-O-L-O-R. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Of course, I can talk about color grading, but um, you know the LUTs are, are part of the color grading, but I think that's a whole separate session we should have. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very complicated and involved thing, uh, but I give you an idea of, 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 of the LUTs, of how you want to treat all the colors separately, how you don't want to apply red, green, and blue uh, independently. But I think I don't want to, I don't want to expand on this right now because it would really go a whole, uh, whole different ballgame. Ah, uh, is there a workaround where we can take a, a color out of RGB? noise and make it look like film noise. Yes, 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 very much so. OK. Certain noise you cannot get rid of. And so look, noise in a digital camera, in any sense, this is a fundamental property. Like, you know, in, in film, as you said, there was a fog. You couldn't do much beyond that. I mean, red, I mean, not red. Uh, any, any digital camera has gone way beyond that. Uh, so yeah, so, so definitely that way. Uh, uh, CMOS sensor, digital sensor is an improvement of the film. So that we see much better in, in, in darkness. But still, when you go to the absolute bottom, you have this colored RGB noise. Now we do a lot of things to get rid of that, especially if you knew. As I said, I didn't talk about that entire process. There is a process through which uh, that color interpolation happens. Remember I talked, told you that a blue pixel does not have the red and the green information. It does it by interpolation from, from the surroundings. How you do the interpolation is where a lot of the RGB noise is. So on one hand, there is a lot of work going on uh, on good cameras to minimize that RGB noise. I mean, you know, in red, there is a huge amount of work that goes on in, in that. Second part is that, <clears throat> is that there are many uh, algorithms available where uh, you can go back and, and do balancing of those uh, RGB values in order to make the noise more of a luma noise than a chroma noise. Now it's it's a complex process. As I said, there is a depends upon how much time you are willing to spend in, in post processing. Very simplistically speaking, there is a uh, there are many algorithms that are that look at a flatness of a scene and and reduce the noise just by averaging. If you average all of those a patch, let's say the, the, the noise that you saw, even if you do a three pixel by three pixel nine pixel average you'll see a lot of the noise has been averaged out. And that's something that is definitely, definitely done. Um, but uh, so there was one more point I wanted to make. I, I, I kind of forget right now. Um, uh, I forget, there was, there was another point I wanted to make. Um, it's gone now, <laughs> it may come back. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but, but, there is a lot of noise. Oh, the grain. Uh, so, so there is a lot of noise reduction algorithms that are that are in place. They're all spatial noise reduction, which are looking at, uh, you know, spatially whatever whatever uh, correlation there is, and you take that and, and fold that back in. There is um, the grain is a very interesting thing, as I pointed out that in in film, the grain is fixed because in a digital camera, your pixels that are, see a three micron pixel, the next to it is a three micron pixel. Next to it is another three micron pixel. They're exactly the same. That's what 
the lithography has given us. That, that's why I said the size matters. When you go to small, small geometries, right now we are making our devices in so 65 nanometer. So the finest geometry you can make is 65 nanometers compared to, let's say, a 5 micron pixel. So a 5 micron pixel next to it is a 5 micron pixel. It was not so in films. In films, the grain distribution was kind of random. Uh, it's anywhere between 6 to 10 microns. And furthermore, when you developed it, not all grains reacted the same way. Some of them grew a little bit bigger. Some of them grew a little bit faster. So all in all, on a film, you have the slight variations in intensity, which gave this background where it, even where there is complete flatness, you get some texture. But the texture was fixed. And that's why it didn't bother us. In fact, it actually gave us some, you know, fooled our, our, our brain into thinking that there's some information there. And brain loves information. That grain can be added back. What's more interesting is that the grains, uh, how those, 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 those pixels uh, exposed or how big they became after exposure, especially after developing, also depended upon how much signal it got. And that's what the halation I was talking about, that instead of having a sharp edge, there is a little bit of a, a roll off. There is a little bit of a glow that you saw. You can add all of these things in, in digital. So in fact, right now, for a good filmmaking, once you've got a good DP, once you've got a decent camera, Red, Venice, uh, Alexa, whatever have you, it's the post-processing that's going to make the difference. And certainly, there are many algorithms through which you can add grain. Uh, and uh, can make it very, very realistic. I mean, the, the, the pictures I uh, show you, the movie I showed you, I hope you saw that. A comparison between Alexa and, uh, and film, you could not tell which is which. And uh, of course, green has been added, halation has been added. And I think Steve Yedlin has done a lot of work on that. And so that could be another session just talking about that. Many different kinds of ways how you give the impression. Uh, one of the reasons, by the way, also this 8K and all matter a lot is of green screen. I mean, more and more as we have this uh, uh, CGI and stuff like that, that, that that's getting used. Uh, making the edge information good, not visually good, but scientifically good, is very, very important. Because that's how you're going to make your you know, subject that you're going to put in pop out from your background. So. When you shoot your green screen with your you know, rest of the rest of the stuff with your with the 8K sensor versus a 4K sensor makes a big difference. So that's the other thing that I actually I forgot to mention that that's one of the reasons why also there is a lot of interest in in, in high resolution uh, cameras. Woo! Rec 7 2020 to 709 to DCPI 3. That that's a <laughs> yes uh, yes. Short answer is yes. That will again. I think. I think the. I, I think what it. What. What it's looking like is that for the post, we have to have a separate session. We can't just uh, talk about all of this when I haven't talked about in the main material. That that requires a, a, a lot of uh, background information to be given. So I think the post discussion. Maybe we can have another session for it. Um, suggest some books. I don't know. Uh, I don't know actually. Shortly, short. At least I don't know. Uh, you know, the, the, the filmmaking now is such a wide range of technical information, from optics to, to sensor technology to, to, to the to the back end processing. I do not know of one book, and even when there are books, uh, you have to do a lot of research, and you have to do a lot of hands on stuff. That's that's the only way. I do not know of any book that will. Uh, give you all of this information. Uh, please print, release print after post. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, you know, I think, I think the, the post questions, I want to not want to answer now because it would require us to go back to the beginning and talk more about the post. Uh, without that, uh, it, it will not make sense. I think I really think we should, we should do a separate, uh, separate uh, uh, session for that. Red Komodo, yeah, interesting. These are all, <clears throat> red has always been 
focus primarily on the high-end market, which is why you have the high-resolution, beefier cameras. Komodo is a is a first one that's going in a different direction, much more along the lines of the mid-grade uh, cameras. So uh, let's see. Uh, personally, I don't think Red's prime main business has just changed. I think this is a offshoot from a different uh, reason, which maybe I shouldn't talk about here. But I think uh, Red Komodo may be a one-off thing. Maybe I think you know. It's a, if you look at the if you look at how the the the, 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 the team has gone, it has gone much more on the DSMC Ranger. Maybe even a range of two, uh, where making the camera as good a sensor as you can get and as good a back end uh, is, is the most important thing. You know, red, red, generally speaking, requires a fair bit of post processing. And the more and more trend is that can you do broadcast quality right off the bat without having to do uh, much stuff? External recorder. Oh, uh, boy. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, can you music and literature, please? Sure. Uh, I don't know. I think now I'm I'm kind of losing. <laughs> focus. No, I think the question for the organizers and not for you. I think. I think, uh, now I'm losing focus. I think. <laughs> I think so we can finish now. So, uh, there are no many more questions. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy that uh, a lot of you stayed back. I hope uh, you got something out of it that was useful. Uh, I learn every day. And that's why whenever Premenda asks me to take a, do a course like this, I, I cringe because it means a lot and lot and lot of preparation for me, uh, which uh, it's lovely to do. But uh, it's also very time consuming. Yes, that's true. We have given so much of time. I cannot <laughs> think that so busy schedule you have. So in between oh, three. Well, it's, 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 uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is something that I also enjoy doing. It's, it's, it's also, uh, Thank you very I, much I, honestly, any, any time, I, mean, I, I think one of the best way of learning is to teach somebody. Because that's when yeah. you really have to think, think everything through. And everything that you thought you knew, uh, you don't know. Till you have to explain it to somebody else, and then you say, "Oh, oh, well, oh, okay, yeah, but this, but this," and that's how uh, you learn more. So, uh, so no, I, I really enjoyed it. I hope okay. uh, uh, and to the decision will be available for anybody who want to study it properly. It will be available in the YouTube channel, free of charges. Anybody can watch it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you, um, and and I know there are lots and lots of questions. I see they're all exciting questions. I think, but I think what it's definitely showing is that we need a session on the post, the post yeah. processing uh, work, which I did okay. cover just a bit, not a whole lot. So thank you very much on behalf of the yeah. of Film Societies of India and from Fipresk India. We are very much highly obliged for such a fantastic masterclass. And that's for the International Teachers' Day. The day is also <laughs> yeah. Well, that is, that is perhaps a, a fitting. I, I hope I have I have kept up the the the, the high traditions of teaching. Yeah, learning from a master. <laughs> that's a master class. It was very good, and uh, we are planning for this session for a long time. Finally, it happened. And uh, in future, we shall try if you can spare some time. Not <laughs> I am not telling that very quickly, but whenever it is possible for you, we'll do that. Uh, yeah okay thank you very much thank you okay, very then. much i really oh. enjoyed it it was an honor doing it and good night for all of you guys and now thank it's time for me to eat something <laughs> okay thank you Bye. you have not eaten breakfast also yes okay. have a coffee that's all okay, okay Bye -bye. Everyone, See you. Thank you very much thank you okay